ever seen since desolation. You just, I think we drove for a mile and there wasn't a building hardly standing. Nobody knew what was going on. They called the situation fluid, but fluid means that nobody knew anything. It was different. If I had done something else, I don't know what I would have done. We're talking today with Mr. Michael McGregor of Belmont, Michigan. The interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Now, Mr. McGregor, can you begin with a little bit of basic background on yourself uh, to start with where and when were you born? <coughs> well, I was born in South Bend, Indiana, February 5, 1943. All right. And was your father in the service at that time? Uh, yes. Yes, he was. He was. My dad was a career soldier. He was, uh, he, he was killed in the Second World War, but he was, when he died, uh, he was in the Army about 19 and a half years. Mm -hmm. uh, he was... Uh, he was in the old horse cavalry. He was in the cavalry when they uh, uh, gave up their horses for mechanization, and then uh, uh, then he transferred. He was with this forming second cav division, which uh, I, uh, he left. He had a problem with. Apparently, he had a problem with one of his commanding officers mm -hmm. or something, and so then he. Uh, uh, he was too old for a combat command, so he was uh, given a, a task of forming an amphibious tractor company, uh, and uh, he did, deployed to uh, Europe and was killed on D-Day uh, in Normandy, so. All right. I didn't know they were actually using amphibious tractors in D-Day, but. Well, they're trucks. Okay. Oh, the, yeah. oh, the ducks. The ducks, yeah. Okay. Ducks. Because there were actual amphibious tractors yeah. that were used in the Pacific and later in Italy. But right. All right. Yeah. So he got in there anyway. All right. Yeah. Now, were, was, so your mother was living in South Bend then. Was that where her family was? Yes. Or? Yes, it was. Yeah. He, in fact, they met. It's, it's kind of crazy. He was an enlisted man for, oh, until sometime in the th mid-30s, and he got commissioned. But he, uh, he was in the 7th Cav, and he... One way or another, he ended up at Culver Military Academy as a ROTC instructor. I, back then, I guess uh, kids, when they got out of, if they went to like a, it was a high school, mm -hmm. uh, but they got commissioned at the end of their high school. Right. And uh, he was uh, he was a polo coach, uh, taught horsemanship, and then military tactics. And then he bought also bought horses for the uh, uh, their black horse troop. Mm -hmm. And they met at a Halloween party. He came with his, you know, in his uniform, mm -hmm. and, and, and that, and my mother commented on what a clever costume it was, and he said, it's not a costume, <laughs> and that's how they met, and they got married, and then they, uh, they lived in Culver until the, uh, oh, the, uh, before our involvement in the Second World War, mm -hmm. they would start, I guess, uh, expanding the army. Yeah, they were building that. up the and army. And then he then. went to, yeah. he was at Fort Hayes. In Columbus, Ohio, for a while. That's where my brother was born in in '41, and then he went out to Fort Riley for the the second cab. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when he went to Fort Riley, my mother moved back home with her parents and, and then lived there until. And then he passed. Then he then he was killed, and right. uh, we uh, uh, then, then just stayed there. So. Okay. Uh, and so then you you grew up in South Bend. Yes. Okay. And then uh, did you finish high school there? Yes, I graduated from South Bend Central High. And uh, then I went to, uh, uh, we didn't have much money, but uh, uh, I found out the, the, I, I got VA assistance mm -hmm. for going to uh, college. I got War Orphans Education right. Act, so we, uh, I, I went to college. I went to two years at the Indiana University Extension Center in South Bend. And you could, at that time, you could only take 60 hours mm -hmm. there. And then I finished up my last two years at uh, IU Bloomington. All right. Uh, and then what did you major in? I majored in history. Okay. And what were you planning on doing with that? Or did uh, you know? I didn't know. I liked history. I thought I'd like to teach. Mm -hmm. So I used some of my electives and took some education classes. And then when I student taught, I didn't really decide I didn't want to teach. And uh, uh, when I graduated, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I, I, I took a job with the Public Health Service as a syphilis epidemiologist. Good background for history. Yeah. Of course. Uh, right. What did they, they actually have you do for that? Well, you would uh, interview people who were diagnosed with syphilis. Back then, anybody mm -hmm. that was diagnosed with syphilis had to, it was reported to the county right. health department. Right. And um, we worked for the U.S. Public Health Service on loan to the, uh, uh, I, I worked in Ohio, to the state uh, Ohio 
Department of Health, who then in turn lent us to various various county health departments. Uh, we would uh, interview people who had the diagnosis and try to uh, trace the source and spread of the disease, and then you know contact the people that they may have, may have been infected and right. get them tested and prophylactically treat it. And, okay. and then how long did you do this kind of work? Just about a year. Now, did you get drafted while you were doing well, that? Well, no, the, uh, the, the draft is, is kind of an interesting uh, thing. When I got out of school, well, in, in college, I had a, a student deferment. Mm -hmm. I got out, and, uh, and I graduated in 1965, and Kennedy had uh, uh, issued an executive order exempting married men from the draft. Right. So uh, then when Kennedy was no longer on the scene, so... Uh, uh, that was going on. I was going to get married in August, August 21st. We were uh, scheduled to get married, and then uh, my buddy LBJ came out and said, "Hey, if you had to be married before the 14th of August to oh. uh, not be drafted, so the invitations were printed, so we had to scratch out the 21st, right in the 7th, and move it up our wedding day. And uh, uh, so, okay, now I thought I'm clear and." Sometime after I got married, it was uh, uh, they, they he rescinded that 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 part of the thing and said the only way you can get out now is if you were a father and mm -hmm. had a child or a pregnant wife. So it looked like the and I couldn't get a deferment, uh, an occupational deferment on uh, with the public health service. So I, we moved back to South Bend mm -hmm. and. Uh, and just in case I got drafted, my Madelines, my wife, could uh, be close to family. And uh, then I took a job in South Bend with Bendix Aerospace, and we made fuel controls for the uh, what became the B1, uh, the F111. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, back then they called it a TFX for whatever reason that was. I figured, gee, now I'm making the tools of war. I worked in production control right. that I, I could get deferred. Nope, sorry, kid. You can't. Mm -hmm. So, and I uh, got my draft notice in September of 66, and I had reported, uh, uh, I reported uh, in, I think, November 15th or something like okay. that. Okay. And where did you report to? Uh, well, I had to, we went down to the uh, Local Reserve National Guard Center. Uh, always the Army does always this stuff at, at, in the early morning hours. Mm -hmm. It's uh, dark and bid farewell and boarded buses, and then we went to the uh, uh, Chicago Induction Center, and were processed there for you know, part of a day, and then put on a train and sent down to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. All right. Uh, and what kind of facility was Fort Campbell, or what was it? Did it have a particular area that it trained for? Or? Well, uh, Fort Campbell, that uh, was uh, it was a training center, I guess, in the First World War and the Second World War. Uh, it, the training center was just reactivated, I think, the summer of '66. Mm -hmm. There, uh, it, it, but it was home for the 101st Airborne okay. Division. They, they they were there, so uh, we had basically World old World War II barracks. Uh, you know, this a common two-story clapboard sited right. cold barracks. Right, yeah, because eh, Kentucky in, in November is not necessarily all that warm. Uh, now, what did the basic training consist of at that time? Well, uh, basic training was an eight-week program, uh, which uh, you, uh, well, the, the purpose was to, you know, you, it, you're not in the Army to wipe your enemy's ass. You're there to... <laughs> Yeah, to, to transform a, a normal, complacent citizen into a soldier, started out with the basics. We d we did a lot of uh, close order drill, manual of arms, uh, then progressed to spend a lot of time on bayonet fighting, uh, hand to hand combat, uh, marksmanship, uh, a lot of always physical training in there. Uh, oh, we did uh, see. How much uh, emphasis was there on discipline and following orders? Well, you you did that. Uh, I mean, it, it was it was communicated to you very clearly that uh, you know you you're here. You'll you'll do what you're told to do when you're told to do it. And uh, we never were uh, uh, assaulted physically, but uh, verbally we were. And uh, and usually the the people that were disciplinary problems were. Uh, 
they were volunteered uh, for you know hand-to-hand -hand combat demonstrations and bayonet fighting demonstrations and and you know go into the okay now you can go into the the building where they have the tear gas without your gas mask instead of with your gas mask to see what it feels like and, and those kinds of things mm -hmm. but it was uh, but it, again my, my training there were probably I would say 80% of the people in my basic training company were reservists and National Guards guys. Mm -hmm. You know, so they, they had uh, something to do. With theirs, uh, we didn't have any disciplinary problems. There's a few guys thought they could get out by, you know, peeing their bed or mm -hmm. whatever. So they just gave them rubber sheets. And a few guys, two guys didn't uh, follow any hygiene rules, but then, you know, the recruits took care of them mm -hmm. and pleased yourself. But. Okay. Now, the fellows who were guard and reservists, were they sort of a little bit older like you were? Or? No, they're just the uh, same same age. It's, you know, you tried to, uh, you know, the, the guard and reserves had a very long waiting list to get in at that time because, mm -hmm. you know, you, you beat the draft that way. And uh, so, you know, a lot of these kids would uh, get on the list when they're, 16 or okay. 17 and you know then they get so you were still kind of an old man then among the trainees yeah I, I was uh, just a few months short of being 23 years old when I got drafted yeah there were f uh, a few of the draft uh, fellows that were drafted were about my age but most were uh, most weren't okay uh, now after eight weeks of basic what do you do next uh, well <laughs> well it's uh, it, it's really kind of interesting. I have to backtrack a little bit mm -hmm. because I was, uh, uh, when you get drafted, uh, you go down there, then you're in a reception center for about a week, your process, and they do extensive physicals and uh, various testing, aptitude testing, preference testing, and that kind of thing. And then they slot you with an MOS. So I was, they slotted me with an MOS where I was supposed to be a personnel specialist. But there's a problem because <laughs> Uh, I got drafted, and my pay was ninety dollars a month, of which they took fifty out, added forty-five to it, which sent my wife. My mm -hmm. wife got allotment of ninety-five dollars. Oh, we had a sixty-five dollar a month car payment, <laughs> so it was kind of tough. I, uh, I, I uh, one of the tests we took was the OCS preference test, so I. Uh, uh, I, I took that, and it was it was really a crazy test. I mean, you could you could just see what they were looking for. It was like uh, like a hundred forced choice questions. You know, I would rather a go to the opera or play football. Mm -hmm. You know, I would rather you know read a good book or go shooting with my friends. <laughs> and so I, I just answered all the macho answers, regardless mm -hmm. of what I felt. So oh man, they, they thought I was going to be General Grant. You know, <laughs> so uh, I was OCS qualified. And then they told me that, hey, gee, you have uh, uh, you're paid as an E5 while you're in OCS, which was a lot of money. And then your wife gets a housing allowance mm -hmm. and all this. Uh, so I uh, I didn't have a physical profile, so I, I opted for OCS, uh, and I had uh, I, I had to pick a combat arm. So my first choice, I think, was armor, armor, infantry, and mm -hmm. artillery, in that order. During basic training, uh, during my time there, and communicating with my wife, then, I'll, then my wife lets me know that she's pregnant. Mm -hmm. uh, she was about a whole month pregnant when I got drafted, you know, when I reported. So if we would have known that, mm -hmm. you know, I, uh, I would have beat it. And uh, she said hey, she was able to get by. We, you know, just do your two years and get out. Mm -hmm. So I thought I dropped OCS in basic training. Well, come to find out, I didn't. Uh, the paperwork didn't get through, so I got uh, I got orders to go to pre-OCS AIT, Advanced Individual Training, in, in field artillery at Fort Sill. So I said, Well, I, I don't want to go to OCS. Well, too bad. You can't uh, you can't drop it here. You got to drop it over there. So I went to Fort Sill. Uh, make a long story short, I dropped it. That's fine. Okay, you don't do your training here. Just go across the street and do your training. I said, well, what happened to the personnel specialist? Too bad. Well, now you're in the artillery. <laughs> now I'm in the field artillery, yeah. All right. Uh, now, what, what sort of condition was Fort Sill in? Because that, too, was an old base and a big artillery center from World War II. Mm -hmm. What did that look like? Oh, beautiful. Uh, well, they had some old barracks, but we were in our, our training area. It was brand new barracks, had squad bays instead of, you know, just the open things of bunks. I think there were four of us in a little squad mm -hmm. bay and uh, uh, just, you know, night, I think it was air conditioned. That was really nice. Nice, uh, nice, nice barracks. And, uh, 
uh, it wasn't as uh, physically demanding as basic training was. We ran every day, did the daily dozen, but uh, you know that was about it. All right. Uh, and then, what did the training program itself consist well, of? Well, I was uh, the MOS they gave me was uh, uh, 13 Echo 20, I think it was, uh, field artillery operations and intelligence, and basically, it had it it, it did two things. It trained you to basically be a forward observer, to uh, uh, identify targets and call target, you know, call fire in on targets. And it trained you to uh, uh, take the targeting data that the F, that the forward observer calls in and uh, calculate uh, uh, ra uh, quadrant and deflection, you know, which way the gun barrel will be, right. uh, you know, horizontally and vertically and what charge to, so you can shoot and hit the target. Mm -hmm. So. It was more of the cerebral part of uh, field artillery. It didn't have mostly classroom work. Right. And I had kind of an edge because during, uh, during high school and my first two years at college, I had an uncle who was a, uh, 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 he was a civil engineer for uh, uh, the local power company. And then he had a business on the side where he would uh, survey houses for the mortgage closing process. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I knew direction, I could read maps, I could estimate distances. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I always said I, you know, I, I, I always did, I, I may not have known where I was, but I knew where I wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, so it was, and then, you know, with by some science courses I had in college, I had a, a geology class that, you know, we really got into, you know, contours of the earth mm -hmm. and contour maps and stuff like that. So it was, uh, it was never that hot on math, but it was, uh, I, I had a, I, I think I had a, a leg up on a lot of people. I could read a compass, I could do a back azimuth, I can, you know, I could take two, two places and figure out where I'm at. And that kind so of you were thing. actually being given an assignment that actually made sense. Well, I guess, yeah. yeah well, <laughs> the Army, I think that's about a 50% batting average on that as far as I can tell over the course yeah. of the years. Uh, but they were giving you something that you actually had some aptitude for. Yeah, well, a lot, you know, a lot of people didn't, though. But it, it was, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure how they slot people in those, you know, I, I obviously that's pre the computers that we know. Mm -hmm. They say, hey, we need X number yep. of people, this and this. And if you have a, this kind of score, that's where you go. And because I had a, when I was in basic training, this one you know, one kid I was in with his he claimed his grandfather was a former governor of Puerto Rico, and uh, and he it was a nice kid, nice young kid, and uh, he uh, he got his orders to an AIT in laundry dyeing and pigmentation <laughs> at Fort Lee, Virginia, someplace, mm -hmm. and so he would be dyeing clothes. So, uh, so I, I'm not sure how they slotted people. Uh, uh, where they did, but I, I know when uh, later when I got to Vietnam, uh, most of the people like the, the FDC and the FO parties were just uh, I call them cannon cockers guys that just uh, uh, worked on the guns. Mm -hmm. you know, they they look for bright guys and they, they would train them because right. they they just didn't have the people. Okay, uh, now how long did the training process at Fort Sill take? Two months. Okay, and then what happens to you after that? Well. Again, I, uh, uh, the stars weren't in alignment for me. I, I had orders to go to Germany, but uh, because I didn't have the rank, they, the uh, Army wouldn't move my wife. So I wanted to stay stateside until she had the baby. I wanted to see the baby because I wouldn't have saw him for you know, the, the rest of my tour. So I put in, uh, they said, no problem. Just uh, give us a letter from the doctor estimating delivery date and da 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 and we take care of it. Okay, fine. So I did that. So the, I guess my orders to Germany, I, I hope they were just being held in abeyance, but they weren't. And so then they put me in a holding battery and uh, uh, basically are day laborers around the, uh, uh, around the post I did that, and then we'd go out, and then twice a twice a week we'd go out and ambush people. Uh, you know, like the we'd be going out road marching for bivouac or something, and we would set up an ambush, and they'd have to practice their anti-ambush stuff. You know, and just shoot planks mm -hmm. and that. Did that for a couple couple three weeks, and then I uh, 
Then I got a permanent job there. I was guarding a laundromat. But they had this laundromat, a nice, beautiful grove of trees, and we had, I think it was four-hour shifts or six-hour shifts, but you would rotate. Like it, one day you had the morning, then you had the afternoon, then, then the evening, and that's all you had to do. It was right across the street from the base library. So, And all you did was sit, sit in or near the laundromat and make sure nobody beat on the machines or tried to rip the change machine off mm -hmm. the wall. and and that kind of thing so i would uh, i had the best of I, I had the best best gig in town i'd just go to the post library get a book sit in the shade and read a book for my shift and that was it so i said gee i could i could do my army career this way this is great but then my wife had the baby i went home and um because i hadn't uh, other than a little christmas leave i hadn't had any leave uh uh, since I've been in the Army now, my, my son was born in uh, July, July 20th. So I went home for, I think, 10 days. I came back, and they said, hey, first sergeant wants to see you. Okay. I want to see him anyway because I had to do some paperwork to get some more money for my wife now that she had a de we had an extra dependent. And he said, guess what? You're on a levy to go to Vietnam. I right. said, okay, thank you, Sergeant. <laughs> so, uh, at this point, what did you know about Vietnam that was going uh, on? We, over there? We, we knew it was there, uh, but it was, you know, we, we knew the war was there, and in, in basic training, we had, every, but, but it just couldn't connect to reality. I mean, that, it, it, something's happening, but I'm not going to go over there. It's not going to happen, you know. Uh, you don't want to accept the reality of it, but in basic training, we had, uh, one of our uh, one of our drill sergeants was a uh, he was profile he was an E I think he was an E seven sergeant first class but he was profile he was in the hundred and hundred seventy six hundred seventy third airborne brigade I don't, anyway mm -hmm. he got he got he got shot pretty bad in uh, Vietnam and he was on a profile so I guess all, all he could do was train troops right. uh, and we had this big black DI who would he'd lead PT every day and they'd have these raised platform they'd be on this platform and had a, he'd have a stump had a big stump on there and he had the biggest biggest sword you ever saw in your life that he'd begin it every day hitting the get the sword just hitting it into the stump and then he'd yell out do you know what that is no drill sergeant what is that that's Charlie cutting your nuts off why is Charlie cutting your nuts off because we're weak what makes you strong? PT. We love PT. <laughs> and then I get into it. So, other than just that kind of stuff, uh, it was there in my AIT class. Uh, I think we had two, two or three guys that got, and we had, I don't know, there were probably 50 of us. Uh, uh, we had two or three guys that got orders to, uh, that went went to Vietnam, but they volunteered to go. They mm -hmm. wanted to go, so it was uh, just just didn't think about it, you know. And did, did you follow the news or pay no. much attention to what was going on? No, I didn't yeah. have the uh, uh, didn't have the uh, we didn't get newspapers. In the holding battery, we had. Uh, they had a day room, so we could go into the day room. But there, the only big deal was that everybody was riveted. Uh, I think it was that summer of '67, mm -hmm. the Arab-Israeli war. Yeah. They had the war. Everybody was talking about that, you know. But but it was, you know, you, you knew Vietnam was there, but uh, yep, you know, it's not going to happen to me. Right. Well, a lot of the official reporting at that point was still that things were going well and and we were winning and and so forth and. Uh, the popular media had not gotten a, as negative as it was going to get after the Tet Offensive, too. So it's a lot of the really strong anti-war movement stuff or the stuff that, that attracted the most attention tended to come a little bit later. So it may have been a little bit easier not to pay that mm -hmm. much attention to it at that time. Because um, that's actually fairly common. A lot of the guys at, at that stage of the yeah. over didn't know that much. No, it was, you know, I knew it was there, and in fact, when I was in college, I think I was a senior, had this uh, one kid who was, uh, or one guy, he, he had been in the service, and he went back to school, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, hey, you guys are going to end up there. You start seeing all the, the thing, and it was, uh, I think, right around the time of, uh, no, it was, you know, it, it was before our big involvement, uh, before 
uh, it, it was before the Yadrang and mm -hmm. that with the, you know, the, yeah. the, the first big That's one. Still, you but, get the GM uh, assassinated in 63 and yeah. then more and more stuff but, happening after that. And, but, you know, again, it was, uh, you know, I, I always say I, I, w I was probably the end of one generation mm -hmm. because as a little older, uh, everybody in my immediate family had served in the Second World War or Korea. Uh, of course, my dad mm -hmm. uh, there, and it, it was, I, and I, get, I lived in a Polish neighborhood. My, my mother was Polish and uh, went to parochial school for eight years and a Polish parochial school. And, you know, you always prayed for Poland to be free and, you're, you know, it, it was assumed we were going to fight Russia. Mm -hmm. You know, you, had, you boys had to prepare for this and then we had the, the stupid thing of ducking under your desk every two Thursday when the siren went off and don't look at the flash and, you know, uh, that kind of stuff. But, you know, it was, uh, uh, you know, we, I, we trusted our government. You know, the government said this. Government was a friend. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, you know, I didn't want to go, but, you know, I wasn't going to go to Canada. I wasn't going to go to Sweden. It says, you know, I don't want to go. I don't want to leave my wife and family and uh, this kind of thing. But if, if I have to, you know, so be it. Right. And, uh, so I had that service, and you know, I guess after us, and sometimes I question the uh, uh, the anti-war protesters' real motive. I think most of them were just afraid of going into the service. Period. They had a, you know, uh, but that's just my opinion. Okay. Uh, now, what's the process by which then they, they get you out? So you, you've gone back to your base. They say, okay, you're going to Vietnam. How long is it before you actually leave? Well, uh, we we had uh, had to go through what they called RVN training, training for. Uh, uh, for Vietnam, uh, it was a lot of class, uh, some classroom stuff on, uh, you know, the history, culture of Vietnam, the political structure, their army ranks, you know, because they had to afford, uh, you know, their people, the military courtesy, just like, you know, ours, uh, had to prepare a will, that was kind of neat. Uh, we had, I'll never forget this, we had a doctor talk to us about genital wounds uh, oh, and you know it has some of the most graphic slides in the world but hey regardless of what happens you can still get it up you know mm -hmm. <laughs> don't don't worry <laughs> about that you know okay then we had to uh, th th then we kind of evolved out in the field we had to uh, qualify with an M16 because when I was in basic training we we still used the M14 had to qualify with that uh, uh, did a lot of ambu anti ambush uh, training. Uh, how to, you know, what what to do when you get ambushed. Da 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 da. And then we had uh, in the middle of the Oklahoma Prairie, they had a Vietnamese village with tunnels and that that we have to we had to secure the village, search it, and you know, just kind of a little preparatory stuff. Okay. So that lasted about two weeks, and then I went home on leave, and. Uh, Went home and came back, and uh, just about a month, mm -hmm. which I, I learned later that it was a non-chargeable leave, so it was a free leave that they gave to me, so it was nice. And uh, uh, went home, and then you know you just tried not to think about where you were going, mm -hmm. and uh, then you went to. Uh, then I had to report. I don't know, remember it was on a s Saturday. I had to report that uh, the Oakland. California replacement depot. Right. And then from there, how did they get you to Vietnam? Well, there they had a, uh, and this is where I encountered some protesters because they, they, they told us that, hey, don't worry if there's people, you know, yelling at you or this kind of thing, just, you know, uh, uh, just ignore them, uh, but it's okay to use, uh, it's okay to use uh, uh, physical means if you feel threatened. You know, so basically saying if you feel threatened, you can whip them, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and I've only, s they were kind of up the block uh, uh, a couple times. Cause we had to cross the street. There's a little bar across the street. We went to the bar. But you had, f uh, I think it was four formations a day, four or five formations a day that you had to go out to the parade ground and they called off the names of the guys who were shipping. And then you got your stuff and went on a bus and went to Travis Air Force Base and got on an airplane and went to Vietnam. Okay. Now, did they fly you straight to Vietnam, or what route? Did you uh, <laughs> I left. We we left Travis at. at uh, I, I think I was at the Oakland two or three days, and uh, we left Travis at about ten o'clock at night, 
and uh, the uh, pilot or somebody had a sick sense of humor because as he took off and was kind of banking, you could see the Bay Bridge and the Oakland Bridge and all that. Loud. Then he played Tony Bennett's I Left My mm -hmm. Heart in San Francisco. So we went from there to we landed in Hawaii in Honolulu uh, mid er, early morning, I'm going to say 2, 3 o'clock. The airport was basically mm -hmm. closed. Just walked around and refueled the plane. Then we went to uh, we flew to Japan, and they refueled in Japan, and got, they let us off the plane there at Air Force Base mm -hmm. there for about an hour, and then we flew into Cameron Bay and right. landed. And what was your first Im impression of, of Vietnam when you got off the plane? <sighs> it was, <laughs> it just opened, got out that door, that heat and humidity, and boom, you know, like took your breath away. It was well. You didn't know what to expect, you know. And and well, I I, I got to say, I I, I I I got very very scared because in Travis waiting to get on the airplane, I didn't have anything to read, and I, somebody left a book there, so I grabbed this book and took it. And it was I don't know if you remember the book as and Johnny got his gun. It was about written by a pacifist in mm -hmm. the 30s about a guy in the First World War that essentially he was just a, a brain and he didn't have any limbs, didn't have any senses, and you know the the story is his one his, his thinking back about his life and two trying to communicate or you know make some sense of where he's at. It just scared the heck out mm -hmm. of me. So I got you know I read uh, what did I pick up here? You know my God and. Uh, so I got there. I, w I didn't know what to expect, you know. I just kind of looked out and said, geez, are we going to be under fire when we mm -hmm. land? And you don't know what to expect, but, you know, they, they look, well, they're not going to land a big uh, big 707 jet and you know, somebody shooting at them, I don't mm -hmm. think. And uh, so I got out. The heat hit us bad. And it was just like any other, any other Army base, you know. It was just uh, uh, the buildings were more fragile looking, you know, most of them were, a lot of them were just roofs and, you mm -hmm. know, some screen sides and that. They took us to a, a replacement area where we, we traveled in our khakis, had to take our khakis off and put on jungle fatigues, and then they just had us fill in sandbags to, uh, I guess, acclimate to the, mm -hmm. to the climate, did that for that day. And then you did that the next day, and then the day after, and I had orders. I thought I, I really thought I kind of lucked out because I had orders for to the, the the first Air Cavalry Division's 15th Administrative Company. So I thought, hey, I I got it made. And somebody told him, no, all replacements go to this, and then okay. they'll put you out to your unit. Oh, okay, gee. So, uh, and while I was there, uh, while I was waiting, then a, a guy by the name of Charlie Poor, who I uh, he was in the holding battery with me and then he shows up there he got ordered the same place mm -hmm. you know so oh, hey that's cool so at least I know somebody now and it was you know you were scared but you know nobody had were carrying weapons mm -hmm. you didn't see any warlike thing I did some fighter fighter bombers or something at the airport they'd be taken off and that kind of stuff but it's just like a you know, like we're sitting here right. you know and uh, so then we uh, I'm not sure how we processed, but uh, I can't remember. I don't we waited two or three days, and then uh, they call their names off, and Charlie and I, and I think we were the only two going to the cab. Uh, we went to the airport and got on a C-123, and they flew us Don K, which is the well, Camp Radcliffe was the base camp of the uh, first cab. They weren't, you know, that was just the rear area. There, mm -hmm. were, there were no maneuver units were there, so there was, they had a new troop desk. At the airport, the airport was just like a Quonset hut without right. sides or, or front or back. It was just kind of open. And okay, fine. And he, yeah, this is where you're going. A the truck will be by here. Jump in this truck, and they'll take you where you're going. So they took us to our. Uh, uh, they took us to the uh, admin company, and we had to do some paperwork. And uh, then they they got a hold of. Uh, uh, our battalion rear, and they came and picked us up and took us uh, to the rear. There's only like two or three guys in a battalion mm -hmm. rear. They had a supply sergeant and a couple clerks. Uh, so we got acclimated. We drew some more equipment.
from there drew our, our rifles. Uh, we uh, zeroed the rifles in, and then, then he told us we would uh, have to go to uh, uh, charm school. So every everybody joining the division had to go through a jungle school, and uh, so we. Uh, uh, we hung around the battalion area for, I don't know, a couple, three days, and then, okay, report down to this place. So we went down there, and it was, and there was probably, again, about 30, 30, 30 or 35 of us. Uh, uh, and a very good comprehensive uh, uh, program. It was led by two very senior NCOs. Of course, they didn't wear any rank, but these guys were good field soldiers. Mm -hmm. And uh, we zeroed our M16s in again. They gave us some practical hints, like you know, never put full 20 in the magazine because it tends to, you know, too much pressure on the spring. It might double feed. Uh, you know, you ain't John Wayne. You don't clip your fragmentation grenades on your web gear. You keep them in their can because they can go. So they gave us a lot of that stuff. They had uh, uh, booby trap courses that we'd have to go through and you know practice. And then we were doing act active patrolling around and then at night we'd have to secure the perimeter or part part of the perimeter mm -hmm. and it's, that's where I had up my first very funny incident we were in a bunker and uh, I'm not sure can I use foul language here okay uh, did you ever hear of the fuck you lizard no it's like a little gecko and it's uh, has a noise like fuck you mm -hmm. you know like just just like that so here my first night in a bunker uh, my bunker mate and I, we got an M60 machine gun sitting there. And <laughs> he's sleeping. I got the first tour. And I hear this. I hear this noise. Wait a minute. I hear it again. And I'm thinking about the old war movies I saw as a kid where the Japs are yelling, mm. you know, we're going to get you. Right. And I got, I got petrified. You know, God, they're out there. They're going to come, come and get me. So I start blazing away. <laughs> I'm shooting a good time burst, you know, doo -doo 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 -doo. this and that. Come on, get me. You know, I'm just going crazy like that. And all of a sudden, boom, a guy grabs me, and one of these NCOs came and grabbed me. What the hell's wrong? Cease fire, you know, and everybody else started shooting. What the hell's happening? And I said, there, the bad guys are out there. They're going, tell me, if they're, if they're saying fuck you to me. And he just pointed. He said, that's a lizard. Don't worry about it, you know. I said, yeah. so I was so geeked and I was so high on adrenaline. I could, my bunker mate and I couldn't sleep. So we, we just spent the night speculating on how we could import these things to the U.S. because mm -hmm. we'd make a million bucks selling them <laughs> on college campuses, you know. <laughs> it would have been. So then the next day, the next morning, we had a, a lecture on the fauna of, mm -hmm. of Vietnam. <laughs> so it was. But you know, it was, it was frightening. That was the first, my first night on a perimeter. You know, you're in a war zone. There's, you know, where the trip mm -hmm. flares are. Your claymores are set up out there. And, and geez, I don't want to expect so. Yeah. So then, uh, then we uh, uh, rappelled off a tower a few times, and then rappelled out of Hueys and out of a Chinook. I think a Chinook came down on a Jacob's ladder, and uh, that jungle, that charm school was about. I don't know, a week, maybe, maybe ten days, and at, at, they, at that time they called it uh, the First Team Academy because that was the nickname of the CAV, the First Team. Mm -hmm. But Army likes acronyms, so it was FTA. And later they changed the name because FTA came to mean something else. You know, fuck the Army. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, so that was uh, there. So then we left there, the Charm School, came back to our battalion uh, headquarters, and. Uh, or rear area, I should say, and uh, the guy, uh, the supply sergeant, uh, most of the battalion was up north around Bong Song and uh, in the Antelope River Valley, and he said we would be joining uh, A Battery, first the 21st, uh, which was down in uh, an Operation Bird in Fantiet, extreme south, uh, southeastern corner of Two Corps. So the next day, uh, we took a, I'm not sure what the, I think it was a C5 or C7, a caribou anyway, a very small uh, twin engine uh, cargo plane. There was uh, uh, there's Charlie Poor and I, 
go into the same place, and they had uh, had a howitzer on there. They had a, uh, and the first of the 21st was the first, first battalion to get the new howitzers. Uh, they, uh, before, m most howitzers had split trails, and that, you know, to, so then to change a, I'm not sure how much they could shoot before they had to actually pick up the trail and move them. And this was uh, secured by a base plate, and it could they could fire 360 degrees. I think it was the M102 A3 or okay. something like that. I don't know what it was. So it was I, I never seen it. It's a lower profile mm -hmm. uh, uh, gun, so we we we, we kept that company and looked at that. We landed in Fantiet. Uh <coughs> LZ Betty was what was it called. It was just outside of Fantiet, a big airport or uh, airfield, and apparently, uh, and that was the rear area for a lot of the units that were on the operation. That he had uh, uh, the second of seventh Cav was there, uh, and I could I just uh, explain the process. The, the CAV didn't have a heavy weapons company in their, their battalion. They had four rifle companies, and later they added a fifth company, a recon company. So they had a, uh, uh, a battery of artillery, six guns assigned to each battalion, and they always operated within their fan. So although, uh, uh, so they, they had LZ Betty. There weren't there weren't any howitzers based at Betty, and then they had two outs, two outlying LZs. They had LZ Judy, and they had LZ Bartlett up in the up in the hills. And of the battalion, one one company was always at at and around uh, Betty. One was at or around Judy and Bartlett, and one was always out in the field doing something. Now, I mean, when they were at the, these LZs, they mm -hmm. would. They would patrol during the day, set up ambushes, stuff like that, and uh, kind of a little stand down, but but not quite. And then, then they, they uh, other one would be other company would be out in the field. Uh, so then we went to, uh, we were just there at Betty for a couple hours, and then we, uh, being in the uh, air cab, it had its advantages because they had a. a Division had a lot of air assets, had a lot of uh, uh, helicopters, and uh, usually there were three scheduled logistics runs to each maneuver element every day, morning, noon, and night. Uh, so we took the, the log run out to Bartlett, and joined, that's where the battery's uh, uh, command structure was at. And uh, we got there, and they tested us. Uh, just see if we knew what what we're supposed to know, and uh, and then just got into the routine. Uh, each uh, the battery supplied a, a FO party to each each maneuver company, which theoretically was uh, had an officer, a recon sergeant, and a radio telephone operator, and. There, I, I don't ever recall where there was always three in the party. There would be one or two, you mm -hmm. know, at the most. And uh, and in FDC, when we were, uh, the Fire Direction Control Center would supply, or the battery would supply the people there. And a lot of times we would, uh, if you weren't full time in a uh, in an FO party, uh, you basically were in the FO party when the company was at your at, at your base mm -hmm. at, at your thing so you would so they'd always have it so between the the grunt infantry grunts and the cannon cockers most of the most of the guys in the batteries spent some time with uh, you know w w with the infantry companies and they were uh, uh, they developed a good rapport and a good relationship okay real good now how quickly did they start sending you out into the field, or did you stay in the fire direction center? Well, I, I, I stayed in FDC till, uh, I, I stayed in FDC for, uh, uh, I don't know, it may be about 10 days. And then, see, the, then they'd have what they, we called hip shoots and raids. And these would be, uh, they both started out the same. A raid only lasted a day. and. Uh, what they call the hip shoot lasted longer, 
that basically uh, you would, uh, uh, we would air assault in somewhere with uh, outside the range of the howitzer. So uh, the, the 105 had uh, about 11,000 meter uh, uh, range. So you'd be maybe 12, 14 clicks, maybe far, farther away. Uh, we'd air assault in, they'd drop guns, and then we'd just shoot the heck out of everything and patrol. And if you didn't have, uh, if you didn't find anything, then you just came back. If, if business was good, <laughs> if you will, then uh, you stayed for a while. And uh, you'd, you'd dig in and start, and then, then you would uh, you'd do that. So it was, uh, I, I, uh, I was there about, about 10 days. And then we went on a, uh, on a hip shoot. Uh, we went out to L set up a place called LZ Catfish out in, way out in the woods. And uh, that's where I got shot at the first time. Scared the heck out of me. <laughs> and the second time. <laughs> but, uh, we, and, and basically what would happen is we would air assault in with the uh, uh, infantry would air assault in. We would be in, I, I, usually in the infantry uh, load or maybe the next wave. It, it just depends mm -hmm. how many birds they had. Uh, and uh, <coughs> we, would, we would usually have the black hat with us, which was a... <coughs> which was the airborne pathfinder that basically operated as a air traffic controller mm -hmm. for the for the place the uh, black hat would be with us uh, usually one of the very senior uh, one of our senior uh, NCOs we call him chief of smoke would be with us and uh, and maybe an officer maybe not uh, we'd go in and then they did basically the chief of smoke would uh, you know you know, if, it, if, if it wasn't a hot LZ, it was very, very easy. It would just, you know, designate where, where their guns were going to be mm -hmm. set up and uh, infantry guns set the perimeter and then you would, you would go. Then you'd come in, you dig in, and then you start patrolling. Okay. Now, did the LZs have, uh, what, what sort of preparation was there? I mean, was there artillery bombardment or did someone go in and knock down trees? Uh, or they well, usually, or? They, they, you, usually, like catfish, usually they look for open areas to mm -hmm. go in. Uh, there, since you're out of the, uh, since you were out of the range of howitzers, you didn't have that. Typically, you would have a artillery preparation, much like you know, the Second World War, or shooting at mm -hmm. the beach before the guys land. Right. And it it, 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 it was a, it was a, a, a good ballet because, <clears throat> but like when catfish, they didn't have it because we were outside the range. So, so what happened was, uh, you had. Uh, ARA, Aerial Rocket Artillery, would work over the area. And at that time, these were just Hueys with big boxes on each skid. Mm -hmm. They had, I think, each box had like 24 rockets in it. And they would uh, they would go in and work the area over, and there'd be a couple gunships right behind them. Again, Hueys with, uh, you know, real fast-firing machine guns on on the uh, on the skids. They would work it over, and as the lift birds would come in, they, they would be shooting. I guess the, the, the perimeter and and everything. Uh, if you had artillery prep, uh, they would they, they would shoot what they call the zone on the thing, and uh, then the la usually a minute before touchdown. And it is this was choreographed. I mean, better than any ballet. You know, I mean, it, it was just a, a thing of beauty to watch. I mean, if it wasn't so frightening that. That the last round fired would be a white phosphorus round, so they'd see the the white, and then the mm -hmm. ARAs would come in, and uh, and then the gunships, and then the birds right behind them, and and it's it's not like you see on on TV where you know the helicopter settles down and mm -hmm. guys jump off, and you know <laughs> he's swooping in, and he might hover for two seconds, and you're jumping out. Mm -hmm. It could be three to six, eight feet off the deck, and you jump out and run like hell, and uh, but and and then you know everything just just, just precision and other things coming in and I mean it, it's just remarkable to, uh, to just uh, you know the, just the coordination mm -hmm. involved in the thing was I, I was I was fascinated by that. All right, now was uh, catfish a hot LZ or was it? No, it, it wasn't hot. It wasn't hot. It was uh, it was kind of a area in, in, in thick woods all around, but it's kind of an open area, some grass, uh, not even elephant grass, but you know, grass maybe, mm -hmm. maybe foot, foot and a half high. Uh, 
and we set up there, and then that night, I had to have a, uh, a guy by the name of Ray and I were going to be on radio watch starting like at midnight. So I mean, I was exhausted. I didn't sleep much the day before because I'm going in there. I didn't know what to expect, and you know, you were scared and have some crazy feelings. Uh, we had the uh, and I dug our holes, dug the position, get everything set up. Uh, I just collapsed. I was I was I was exhausted. So I, I fell asleep and. Uh, I was still sleeping, and then Ray woke me up, and he just he motioned for me to be cool, real quiet, just look, and I, I couldn't help but notice, because we were almost on the perimeter, and somebody had tripped, we had some trip flares out there, and somebody, uh, somebody tripped one of them, and I'll oh, see, you know, say, and like a rookie, I look right at it, and there goes my night vision, mm -hmm. you know, so, and, uh, and then, uh, it sounded almost like an M1 guy. Uh, somebody lit off a bunch of rounds coming in, and it sounded like a heavier caliber than you know. Uh, and it, it, that was real eerie, just going right over my head. And, and but Ray, you know, I Ray, you know, and, and nobody fired. Uh, and Ray just said, "It's uh, you know, Charlie just wants to see where you know, see where our automatic weapons are and." Mm -hmm. All that kind of stuff. Don't do anything. He's he's just scoping us out. You're, you're okay. And uh, then one of the howitzers started shooting some time fuse into woods over our head, and that, that was that was the end of that. So never did find anybody. But uh, I guess they were they they knew we were there, and I guess they just wanted to tell us they were there. Now, what was this, this uh, Operation Bird that, that they're doing? What was that supposed to be doing? Well, uh, I, I think it started, uh, well, you got to go way back. The, the, the second of seventh cav was almost decimated in the Idrang Valley, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the day after the big battle. Right. You know, when right. they, they marched out on, in line, yeah. you know, to, to get extracted. So they really got beat up pretty mm -hmm. bad. Yeah, they were re, I, I think they, I think that's why they got, uh, uh, selected for it. So they, 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 they restaffed and got guys in there. And then there was this, in, in the Fantheat Valley, it was kind of a, not in the Fantheat area, it was kind of a, a rice growing area. And then you had hills and, and it's kind of a self contained enclave. It was Highway 1 went through there and the railroad went through, but neither was open. And, and it basically, as I understand, the Viet Cong pretty much controlled the whole area. Mm -hmm. So they started Operation Bird to go down. Uh, I, I guess because it wasn't, it, uh, I'm not sure the, I, I don't think there are too many hardcore VC there. I'm not, uh, I, I don't know if there's main force battalion there or not. But uh, anyway, they, they brought it down there to basically break the siege, open it up, guard the rice harvest. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did. They just started in Fantheat and just kind of worked out and, and basically pushed uh, you know, push Charlie back up into the mountains and uh, and then uh, just secure it. So I, I think that was, and I think they brought it, I think they let the 2nd and 7th go there to kind of just lick their wounds and mm -hmm. because it was phenomenal. They had, uh, I think they were there 16 months, 17 months, and uh, <laughs> they said we had like, uh, you know, everybody, you know, body count. There was just like, I think there were just like 34 U.S. guys killed down there, and they killed like almost a thousand, you know, VC or can, well, what they said were VC. Mm -hmm. uh, so. So you're in that. So they're actually in the same area for an extended period of mm -hmm. time, which sometimes was kind of an unusual for units in Vietnam to be in that place that long, for a unit of that size. Did you were there was there much by way of civilian population around? I mean, you said you're protecting rice harvest. And yeah, so and forth. the city of Fantheat was pretty big, and in mm -hmm. fact, uh, uh, Fantheat was the. I, I probably pronounced it wrong, the Nook Nguyen's capital of uh, Vietnam and the fish sauce that they use, like mm -hmm. we use ketchup, and s s town smelled like, <laughs> mm -hmm. smelled like fish sauce. Uh, yeah, they're there and it's uh, little hamlets and things out. It's uh, out in the hills, it was all free fire zone, but uh, uh, it was... Uh, what does that mean? I mean? You're allowed to shoot if you want to or...? Well, anybody you see, you assume they're hostile and you, okay. you, you take them out. It was, uh, uh, you know, and it's, 
I, you know, I was, a lot of times you wonder if anybody told the people to live there that, you know, it's, uh, but, you know, it was, it, it, that was it. So, yeah, uh, the, the civilian population was, uh, in fact, it, it, it was nice because we could get, uh, as, as I was there, you could get a pass going to town, you know, I mean, you'd be a good soldier, you'd get the morning log bird, go back, and just so you're back out in the field at, you know, five o'clock or whenever he came back out so and what was there to do in town a drink uh, you know a lot of guys I was married I wasn't interested in it but a lot of guys want want some female companionship mm -hmm. and uh, uh, drink and just drink hang around house, their yeah. head and it's kind of kind of interesting because there was a bar it's called Rita's and they had they served hamburgers <laughs> uh, made out of water buffalo <laughs> I, I, you know what it was there but they had uh, uh, and it was it, it really kind of sad in a way because it, uh, that apparently was a big watering hole for the French because the French had uh, the, the the story went that they had a mobile group or something mm -hmm. based there and it wasn't too far from the Li Hong Fong forest which mm -hmm. was kind of up the coast and inland and that mobile group was no more you know they got they pretty much uh, got got wiped out and in fact in Rita's it, it, it's so funny because it, it, it Rita's this bar the Buddhists use a lot of symbols and one of the symbols is swastika so this one fella and I are in there having a couple beers and guy, oh, middle aged guy white guy walks in drunk he sees this thing and he start going Heil Hitler and all this stuff and he's going crazy and a few of the other guys in the, in in there, I didn't know know them, but a few of them had been in Germany, so they start giving them a hard time in German. I, you know, mm -hmm. telling them his mother wears combat boots in German, or <laughs> wow, he went in, so they kind of got in an argument, and the guy left. But uh, uh, the Vietnamese lady, Rita, I guess that was her name, said that he was uh, he was in the Foreign Legion, mm -hmm. and he was supposed to be in that group that got wiped out. Yeah, but he had malaria or something and couldn't go, so I guess he just stayed there when mm -hmm. his time time in the army was up, and he just lived there. So, but it, it, that got me to think. I said, "Gee, you know, there's been people doing basically the same thing we've been doing for mm -hmm. how long?" I mean, you know, that was uh, this was sixty sixty seven. Yeah, and so you're going back. That 15, was maybe yeah. fifteen twenty years yeah. before. You know, it was it was incredible, but. Uh, so we'd just do that, walk around town, uh, uh, get a haircut. Mac V had a, uh, uh, it looked like a, your typical courthouse in small town America. They had a mm -hmm. big, big uh, stone building that they had a little PX. You could buy a box of cigars or something mm -hmm. and uh, uh, get, uh, well, there once, but you'd go and get a haircut, shave, you know, you get a, Shave and a haircut for like fifty piastas okay. or something. And this was and this was the place where you got you actually bought yourself uh, just a, a notebook or something to write in. Right. Yeah. I, I I came over when I came over. I had a little little notebook that I I, I was a history major in uh, uh, college. So I said I'm going to keep me a diary and it's going to be. And I I had a a, a friend who was in. Uh, he was a graduate student when I was uh, I think a I met him when I was a junior at IU he got his uh, masters in English and then he had joined a Peace Corps and he was in uh, Iran and then uh, his tour was up and then he took a job with him stayed mm -hmm. there and you know we corresponded and he you know all he used to tell me hey this is historic times you know make sure you don't forget anything mm -hmm. and you know da 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 and you know if you write letters have people save them and and uh, you know uh, so then I, in one of the markets, I my one notebook was full, so I went and bought another one, uh, a little rice paper one that could fit. In a, well, we carried Prick 25 radios, so we had to change the battery every day, and the battery came in a, a nice plastic bag, so I'd take the top off and then make it nice and waterproof mm -hmm. and you know carry it around. Yeah. So I, I, w I was able to get into Fantiet. We were there from, well, maybe 1st of October till mid-January, maybe. Mm -hmm. I maybe I got into town four times, five times, something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. It wasn't, wasn't, it was nice. 
Uh, were the people generally friendly, or do they not pay attention to you? Or uh, if they're hustling, they wanted money, they pay attention to you, mm -hmm. and uh, I. I would do a little currency speculation. You know, you, you weren't supposed to have greenbacks, which mm -hmm. I didn't have at that time. But, you know, we used MPC, military payment certificate. It looked like monopoly money. Mm -hmm. And they never did change it, but they were always saying, well, hey, if the color changes, then your money's no good. You have a certain period of time to mm -hmm. change it. So the people were using that in the local economy. And they, the people didn't... Uh, so I, I found out early that you could, and on LZ Betty, they had a, a I don't know what it, what it was, banker. Uh, uh, you could go in and say, hey, I got MPC, you know, I want piastas. So it was like 118 piastas to a dollar. So they give you a, like a 100p note. Mm -hmm. So you go out and you trade somebody a 100p note for a dollar. <laughs> you know, so you make 18% on your money. You know, because I didn't have that much money, but uh, you did a little bit of it. And uh, so I'd do that. Sometimes we'd take what we got in the field. We got what they call supplemental rations, uh, SP packs. So they had a lot of soap in there. You could, you could sell bar soap in town for a dollar, you know, dollar MPC. So we'd take some soap in, some ammo plastic maybe, and, you know whatever you can put in your pocket. And I wasn't supposed to do it, but uh, do that, buy a bottle of wine or something. And so. now during this time when you're in that area, was there really very much going on in terms of, of fighting, or was it just mostly you go in and out of these places? And We got, uh, th there were two, there were really two rough incidents. We, we'd get harassed a lot, and, uh, you know, probed a lot, but uh, uh, there, were, there were two two times where you could say it was a pretty ma not a major engagement, not not in terms of the number of people involved, but the uh, you know the ferocity of the thing. Mm -hmm. There was a, um, uh, one was around Thanksgiving Day. Uh, Delta Company. Era solved it in, and they, it was it was kind of crazy. It was a hill, real hilly, and it's kind of a little plateau, and then the hill, a, a massive went up, and they could only put I think one chopper at a time in there. That's the only only thing. So they came in, they put first one down, guys got off. Second one came down, guys got off, took some fire, it went away. Third one came down, took took a lot of fire, and wouldn't go anyplace. Mm -hmm. So that was there. So the, the, the people there, they could get off the plateau. They had complete defilade from the, uh, 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 they had some bunkers on, on the hill. They had complete defilade for, from there. But, uh, uh, and in fact, that's the only time I think that, that was the only time we aerosoled it at night because we I, was, I went with the relief force uh, to get them. We went to the base of the hill and then, then, then worked up. But during the uh, during a situation, somebody called on a napalm strike, supposedly on the helicopter, but they wanted to toast it. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, of course, they, they hit hit the guys they had out in the flank, and that sort of there were a few guys killed from friendly fire, but all the all the other guys, the, the VC and their bunkers, they were they were they were toast too. Mm -hmm. So that that was one bad time in about I was going to say probably two two or three weeks later, basically the same kind of thing happened again. Uh, but that it it was it was relatively uh, all all the heavy stuff. I I, I really lucked out because mm -hmm. all the heavy stuff was over by the time I got there. I mean, right. other than we just got harassed. Uh, we'd be in <laughs> like LZ. I, I liked LZ Judy a lot. That was you had a lot of uh, more freedom, and it was in the flat land. And it was uh, we never had that many guys there. But you know, we'd have three howitzers there. They'd have four dusters. You know what a duster is? It's a small helicopter, isn't it? No, no. A uh, duster would be the, uh, uh, it was a s Korean War anti-aircraft kind of thing. It was a tank chassis with twin 40 millimeter okay. cannons on Okay. Uh, they had four dusters and a quad 50 there with a big berm around the perimeter. I mean, it was. Yeah, you're using d duster with dust off, which is a different term oh, entirely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. 
but uh, I we call I we call them dust. I have no idea what you know what what they would be there. Uh, so yeah, we, we were pretty secure. They would uh, you know we had crazy things that happen. Uh, we would get a. I know one day we found four or five eighty-two rounds in, in within the perimeter, but they. <laughs> <laughs> he pulled the arming pin out. Oh, so mortar rounds, that yeah. 82 millimeter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a NBA or a VC uh, did that. So they, you know, they, I guess they wanted to shoot, but they didn't want to hurt anybody. So mm -hmm. they didn't pull the pull the arming pin out, and uh, we found those buried and you know, kind of say, what's that? Oh, mm -hmm. geez, you know. And then they drop a few rounds in on us every now and then, but uh, a lot of sniper fire, uh, but. Uh, more more harassment, so it, it was really kind of winding down. Uh, we did a lot of operations out in the woods, and you know, I, I found with the Cav, uh, as we kind of get into it, when when the Cav would first hit some place, there were there would be some intense stuff, but after that, you know, a, after the initial thing, it was you know a. We don't we don't want to mess with mm -hmm. uh, these guys. You know they they uh, we're gonna go away fight another day or right. or, or something because uh, and you know we we can k kind of keep them off balance because yeah you know, we go we literally went wherever we wanted to whenever we wanted to mm -hmm. you know it was you know I mean it's 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 a thing of I I'm a, I'll, I don't want to get the cart before the horse but like when we went into on Operation Pegasus, when we relieved Case on, it was, you know, even the Marines, they were, with their, they were just flabbergasted that, you know, we put down, you know, two brigades mm -hmm. in like three hours, right? You know, into five different LZs and just, you know, mm -hmm. just, and you know, the brigades, each brigade had their direct support 105 yeah. battery with it, had their, you know, whatever other. Uh, you know, associated units. They have. Well, it was and, just and the uh, brigade is a pretty big maneuver unit for yeah. Vietnam. I mean, yeah. often battalion-sized operations. Yeah, was brigade large was. Uh, yeah, brigade was. Well, that, the the going into uh, Pegasus was a division. Right. We had to hold division. Yeah, brigade went three 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 maneuver battalions. Okay. All right. So uh, you're in. You're sort of operate bird or sort of that goes on into very early '68. Mm -hmm. So a little bit before the Tet Offensive starts. Right. Now, did they move you out of there before Tet yeah. started? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we the, the operation was winding down. In fact, while we were there, the uh, well, the, the 101st had a presence there on and off for a while, and then we were. Uh, in fact, we uh, we gave up some of our LZs, and we were way out in the field. Uh, uh, they came back. They came down there, but uh, I guess they just decided that they wanted to. Uh, have the whole division together, mm -hmm. so uh, it uh, uh, first part of uh, yeah it was the first f first part of January that we uh, we moved out and we went up to uh, uh, flew C120 uh, C130s up to uh, English LZ English around Bong Song, and then <coughs> my particular unit we went out to a, a place that was called LZ Mustang, which was on a was in the Onlo River Valley, and it was uh, it's cold, cold and wet, and uh, uh, we were there again. It was an old, I, I guess it was an old French place because they even had you know concrete pillboxes like mm -hmm. you'd see in the movies and yep. this kind of stuff. There, there was a, a old steel bridge over the river, but that was, you know, it was wasn't passable and was all blown up. So we were operating around there. Uh, and had kind of an unnerving time there. Was I? I, I was going to say I. Uh, the closest I came to sheer panic was <laughs> was going to the bathroom. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, the uh, at, 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 th at this place it was when the uh, uh, we, we heard about the, we heard the North Koreans captured a ship or something. The Pueblo, and, uh, yeah, the Pueblo. So you know what that was about. So it was about a week after that happened, our rear area supply guys come out and they're measuring everybody for winter uniforms. <laughs> so what says for? Well, we may have to go to Korea because of mm -hmm. the North Korea. Well, oh, I ain't going to Korea. I signed up for Vietnam. I don't want to go someplace else. You know, it was that was really crazy. But we were there, and it was uh, uh, we get probed every night, and it was uh, it was.
it was something like uh, uh, almost like you know we, we want you to know that we're still here but don't bother us and we won't bother you kind mm -hmm. almost because we'd find uh, and I don't know what they were trying to do. I, in retrospect, I thank God we were out there in the middle of no place as opposed to by a, by a city right. because that's where, you know, all of the Tet stuff started. Because mm -hmm. I know we had a, uh, uh, I know I went out, a chopper, a log bird coming in and saw about 200 guys. You know, they, they, and they thought they were Arvins, but there were no Arvins around there. Mm -hmm. So they landed, told it, so we went out. They, they sent a platoon out there, so I went with the platoon, and uh, they found a mama son out there. So, oh, no, no, that's VC, VC. Mm -hmm. you know, we made record time getting back. But uh, <laughs> uh, they didn't, uh, uh, you know, we didn't have any any major contact. That we, we, we get a lot of guys, uh, uh, and one night, one day we had I don't know, 10, 12, 15 of them came in on Chu Hoi. You know, they, the Psy War people would drop the leaflets you to bring this and it's your safe conduct pass. And, mm -hmm. you know, so most of them were sicker than dogs, you know, they had malaria or. So you're basically or getting. Were they, were they coming in just North Vietnam or were they in North Vietnamese uniforms? The, or? Uh, these were North Vietnamese. They okay. were khaki guys. Right. And uh, getting probed one, one night, and I know I had to, I had to urinate, so <laughs> I went to the. Uh, I left my weapon. And I got up and uh, we, we had what, if you're ever someplace long enough, you have what they call piss tube, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I'm, I'm taking a leak and all of a sudden there's three real rapid explosions not too far from me. Holy shit, what is this? So rather than go back to where I came from, I'd go out by the perimeter and jump in a hole with a guy there. And uh, what it was was uh, we had three strands of wire around this place. They had one out about 100 meters, and they had one like 30 meters, and one about 15 meters away from the fighting position, mm -hmm. you know, whatever you call it. And a uh, fella got, to, and then he, those things went off, then he tri triggered a couple of claymores, and uh, then they fired some illumination. But what it was is a fella came in and uh, got to the last strand of wire and just threw three hand grenades right in a row. I mean, you mm -hmm. know. Incredible, and so he was kind of laying on the wire, or what was left of him, and they shot him a couple times just to make sure. And uh, it's in the next day we went out and we got the guy, and he had black pajamas, but mm -hmm. under that he had his khakis. He was he was a soldier. Mm -hmm. He was NVA guy. I always felt bad for that guy. He was talk about bravery, mm -hmm. you know, incredible. I mean, I just, you know, the guy knew he was going to die, yeah, and he did it. Well, that was, I mean, they were the sappers. I mean, that, that was what they did. Yeah. He, he knew he was going to die, mm -hmm. and uh, he did it. And then, you know, he didn't have anything of military value on him, so obviously he knew he wouldn't come back, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, didn't have a picture of whatever, and we, we dug a little hole and put him in there. And I was kind of sad about that guy. That, you know, here, here an incredibly brave guy is in an unmarked grave someplace and, you know, never, never, never got to hold his wife again or anything else. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just, just incredible, just, just, just incredible. The the bravery, I I, I never never forgot about that guy. It was, uh, you know, and somebody say, hey, Mike, you do that? And they, no mm -hmm. way, no way. Yeah, well, they were willing to do that, and that's why they outlasted us in the war, at least in part. But, all right, you were out there for because this is again is early '68. So you were out there in the field when the Tet Offensive yeah, started up. Yeah, Tet, right. Tet started. Uh, the cities were going crazy. Mm -hmm. We get uh, orders to be prepared to move on like 45 minutes notice, and we go up to. Uh, yeah, I don't. We probably sat there about a week in the Tet, maybe not quite a week, mm -hmm. and then we went up to L. Uh, Back to English, and then we uh, we redeployed whole brigade, third brigade went up to uh, Quang Tree. We mm -hmm. flew to Quang Tree. And uh, that's a very far northern end of South Vietnam. Right, that's not too far from the DMZ. Yeah, and the North Vietnamese had come down across there and taken Quang Tree and gone into Hue mm -hmm. at the start of the Tet Offensive. Mm -hmm. So, are you part of the counterattack at that point? Or? Yeah, we were. Uh, we w we went up there. Uh, I guess they they just sending everybody and his uh, uncle up there. And uh, we we were screening. We went to Quang Tree, and uh, and then it's the first time. 
I road marched. Uh, then we went down by truck from Highway 1 down to, uh, uh, we took over a, a Camp Evans, which was a, a Marine regimental uh, base or mm -hmm. headquarters or whatever. We, we, we made that, uh, we took that over and then began securing the area there. Uh, other maneuver units like, uh, uh, I, th I think it was more the second brigade. They went down into Hway or that kind of thing. Closest we got there was uh, we went down again uh, another road march. It was really really crazy because uh, uh, you know coming down from Quang Tree, I said, hey, that almost looked like a World War II newsreel. You know, all the people mm -hmm. waving or throwing sea rations at them and stuff. And uh, but then you see the the bits and pieces of other vehicles that mm -hmm. were blown up. And, so we went, uh, we, we had to go and block, block to the north of Huey. Uh, we went down Highway 1 to the a river crossing. There was a bridge, uh, I don't know, maybe two, three kilometers outside of Huey on the north side. And we had to secure that bridge. And on the side, there was, it was an old, it must have been an old French fort or something because it was built like in a horseshoe. He had a river here, the open end was to the river. And, but, you know, they had a lot of, again, cement pill boxes with firing apertures and, you know, uh, French obscenities about the army scratched into the walls. <laughs> you know, it was... Uh, it was crazy. So yeah, our job was to, uh, we had to secure that bridge and then uh, uh, do, uh, you know, fire support for whatever whatever else was happening mm -hmm. there. And we, uh, and we did that for a couple weeks, I think. And, uh, it, it, you know, the, all the heavy fighting in a way, we missed, missed this ad. Although we had enough, we were... We every night we'd see guys on the other side of the river, you know, with starlight scopes. We see squads of guys here and there. We'd, we'd some guys we'd capture, mm -hmm. uh, captured a few guys. They, I don't know if they were, they weren't NVA. They, I don't know if they were VC or if they were just some poor guy that the VC got because they didn't have any weapons, but they were mm -hmm. toting ammunition, you know. So you'd be a porter or something, right. you know. So we, we, we we'd get some of those guys, but then uh, we secured that bridge and. Um, did a got hit. Yeah, we they, they'd shoot at us. We we get a lot of recoilless rifle fire into us uh, from uh, other side of the river, groves of trees mm -hmm. and other kind of buildings, and they set up and then we, we we'd fire back and uh, we wouldn't wouldn't go over there to look at them, but right. uh, it was uh, it, it was there for. And I don't know if these were remnants of the guys in Hue or they're just trying to get away or what. But then, and, but it was really kind of funny because we had, uh, you know, the, we'd heard that they they brought in uh, uh, from our strategic reserve. They brought guys in. Uh, they said the 82nd Airborne was coming in. And of course, the road, the bridge, we'd close the bridge down at night. You know, so you couldn't cross at night. Mm -hmm. Because the road was closed, so you know these guys got stuck here, and so some of these guys are in stateside fatigues. <laughs> you know, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. You know, I felt sorry for these poor guys. But then, you know, we we get. The, I know I never forget one guy. He's a truck driver. <laughs> Bridge was closed. He, oh, I'm gonna crash with you guys. Oh, you're not gonna crash with us. You're gonna we got a hole there. You're gonna do four hours on the perimeter. Mm -hmm. You know. Oh no no! I joined the army just to drive a truck. I don't wanna. <laughs> well, okay, you stay in your truck then. I don't care. <laughs> so he, he came with us in the hole, but uh, it was, uh, that was fine. So we'd see a lot of different people come through. A lot of Irvins come through. They wanted, uh, they, I, I'm not, I'm, I, I was always suspicious of people, but, uh, you know, they wanted, they'd want something shot up and, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we wouldn't do it, but. Oh, I had a VC there. Oh, okay, that's fine. Well, go go get them. Do what mm -hmm. do what LBJ wants you. Asian boys doing what you should be doing. You know, that's, uh, so we were there for uh, a couple weeks, mm -hmm. and then we went back up to uh, getting there was kind of fun because well, I shouldn't say fun. And in, in retrospect, it, it, it was frightening at the time because we convoy now going to convoy down a truck. <coughs> 
and missed helicopters. I was uncomfortable. And we, we, we pu pull on the road, and then we pick up on the radio that there was a CB convoy just ahead of us that was taking some fire. So, you know, the, nobody had a bugle, but you now there the calf goes speeding up, mm -hmm. and by the time we got there, it was every, it, every, everything was over. So, okay, we're going to keep going. So our truck has a flat tire. So, but everybody else leaves. Mm -hmm. Now here we are. Oh, he smokes. I, what is that? that driver, I said, you better hurry up and change that tire, man. You know, so, so then it, it, nothing happened, but, you know, it was a lot of anxiety for a while. And then we just took off and went, went down. That was, I think we called that LZ Noah. Uh, went down there. And then, well, that was over. Then we came back to around Camp Evans. And uh, not too long after that, Operation Pegasus started. And again, I, I kind of missed some good stuff because we're getting ready to go Pegasus, and an in-country R&R came down, and I put in for it. Mm -hmm. I had about six months in about this time, and I got it. So I got to go to Da Nang while they were uh, deploying. Uh, so I missed the initial deployment, but uh, uh, I missed it by a day as it turned out, because we went, the whole division went up, and they went to, uh, they started what they called LZ Stud, I think it was. And and it, I, I think the, the I, I don't think the North Vietnamese were expecting air cavalry, because I, I, it almost seems like they, uh, well, you had Highway 9, mm -hmm. kind of, went from like Quang Tree into Laos. Right. And then they had this old road, that little two track that mm -hmm. went off into, uh, into Quezon. So it seems like they, the North Vietnamese knew that we were gonna do a relief thing at some point. Mm -hmm. So they fortified a bunch of hilltops around there uh, on the assumption that we were gonna use the road as an mm -hmm. axis of advance. Right. And, uh, but they didn't count on our coming in on top of them. And it was, uh, it was, uh, I, uh, we went to, uh, they, I'm not sure where they were. They went to Stud and they air sold it in someplace else. Then they went into what they called LZ Thor, which was about five kilometers maybe from Quezon. I mean, on uh, kind of on top of a ridge. Mm -hmm. And Quezon was like over there. So I had to go around that way. And, uh, and I joined them. I think. Well, I think they went in in the morning, and I, I, I got, I got, I got there in the afternoon. I mm -hmm. think. Yeah, yeah. That's when a good friend of mine was killed there. In fact, a guy. I always feel bad about it. A fellow who was doing what I would have been doing. I think. He he was covering for me. He, mm -hmm. he got shot by a sniper. But, uh, but anyway, he took over. LZ Thor, the LZ Thor, and then we, are, you know, this inner service stuff. Okay, just cool your jets, hold the place, let the Marines come through. So then a bunch of Marines come up the road, and they, uh, that's the next day they went in. And, oh, they, they probably didn't get maybe 500, 750 meters away from us or whatever, and they, they really hit the, hit the stuff. So then they come back mm -hmm. and they then kept going back on where they went. So then uh, Delta Company was uh, Delta Company second and seventh was on the on, on, on Thor with us. So a uh, company commander puts together an ad hoc group. He says, Oh let's take a stroll down the road and let's go to Gason. Oh, anybody game? Oh, okay. So so there was a, so this, somebody put a sign there, you know, case on open courtesy of this Delta Company segment. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they walked, we walked into there and, it, and nothing happened and they came, came back. But uh, yeah, that was interesting because that was the first time I, I was under artillery fire from the other guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it'd be, I'd be calling in 105 fire on somebody and my counterpart is calling in 130 fire on us, you know, but they were, I, I'm not sure if they wanted to. I, 
I'm not sure if it was all that observed or what, because they, they could they could have really hit us by with high angle fire, mm -hmm. you know, shooting up, but they didn't. But of course, you know, if they did high angle, then we could really the target detection guys could really figure right. out where they were and, and nail them. So they were either long or short, you know, right. over us. And uh, uh, but that was the uh, first couple three days they were shooting at. I guess they were. I don't know if they were in the DMZ or in Laos. Yeah, well, they had they wherever. had guns in Laos. They had guns in in the mountains on the along the ocean border. They had a lot of stuff in positions where we couldn't hit them very well. But now did, so did you actually walk into Quezon yeah. then? Yeah. All right. Yeah. And, and what was there? What did it look like when you got there? Just uh, any other LZ, you know, just a, a forward place. It's not nothing pretty. A lot of bunkers, a lot of sandbags, a lot of wire, a lot of craters mm -hmm. around there. You know, it's just uh, just because uh, yeah, there had been pretty intense fighting there for quite some time, yeah. and a lot of bombardment and so forth. Yeah, they were they were getting a lot of incoming. Uh, for a lot of times, but it just uh, you know just like any other mm -hmm. place. I mean, it's a uh, the, the, so, some of the some of the land is really pretty, but you know if it wasn't for war, it'd be it, it'd be nice. But it was uh, we just went in and, it, and then scooted it right back out, you know, mm -hmm. just because uh, I didn't even wanted the Marines to come. And then the Marines came back uh, the next day or two days later. They came come back down the road. And they had guys in short pants. They had a couple Australians with them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just well, that's that's what they wanted. That's what they did. But yeah. it was a. Uh, it was interesting. We went, uh, we did that, and uh, then we went to, uh, we pulled back. After the Marines came through, we pulled back. Uh, we went back to LZ Stud. All the cab was disengaging, and then we got, uh, we got selected to be the rear guard at LZ Stud, which means we didn't really have to do anything until everybody left. And. Uh, We didn't really want to eat sea rations, so we so we had a couple guys that were good improvisers. So they 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 took off and they come back with that. It's a, kind of a funny story. They they come back with a refrigerated truck. <laughs> they, they they hijacked the third brigade command headquarters company, <laughs> third brigade. They hijacked their mess truck. So we improvised some grills with uh, ammo rods and. We were eating steak 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. That was that was a good time. Then we then everybody left, and then we had to police up the place. And you know what, what couldn't be backhauled or wasn't worth backhauling would be uh, destroyed mm -hmm. and burnt or whatever. And then the engineers would do some stuff. Uh, you know, because they like the ammo boxes. They would you know, they, the Vietnamese would use the nails. They could use them for different stuff. So a lot of times where we had a fire, they They'd bury some some stuff with long delay fuses on mm -hmm. it, and so on. They were picking through the stuff that go off, and and it, yeah, that was really kind of crazy because you know we would a 105 round is 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 a semi fixed. It looks like a big bullet. You know, you have a brass case and mm -hmm. that you can take the projectile off and the powder charge. Well, if you on on these things, uh, they wouldn't want to back all the rounds. They'd back all the brass, so you just you know look for things to shoot at. Hey, I gotta we gotta get rid of 300 rounds. What, you got anything mm -hmm. I shoot at? Well, okay, there. I heard a chicken over on that hill. Why don't you start firing? And, uh, you know, it's uh, so. But anyway, whatever couldn't be back all, or wasn't worth it, then we'd, you'd destroy it. Right. Police, uh, we found all kinds of stuff. I mean, it was just surprising because I think they were only there for probably two weeks, three mm -hmm. weeks at the most, and you know, all kinds of stuff. So then we went back to Camp Evans, and they were already planning what what they called Operation Delaware. Then was going into Ashaw Valley, mm -hmm. and that was uh, that was that was a hairy time. Uh, we have, uh, I guess, we hadn't been in the Ashaw Valley for. The one thing I heard about Vietnam even before I got drafted was it got some bad press here that there was. Uh, L, uh, a camp, a special forces camp or something was getting overrun and they, they sent in a helicopter or more than one helicopter to bring the Americans out and all these the local Vietnamese mm -hmm. people or Hmong tribesmen or whoever, they were all on the skids and they went in there and happened to beat them off so the helicopter could take off. I remember they got a lot of bad press mm -hmm. and it uh, turns out that was in the Ashaw Valley. So, it was, uh, so we went there 
it was uh, it was uh, it was a uh, oh we went we went in it, it was tough because there it was uh, I mean that was the valley's not that wide but uh, it, it was really heavy thick country I mean mm -hmm. really you know I I, I have a lot of empathy for these guys that were humping that their whole time, you know. And we, uh, we Eris, uh, we we came in a little later. Uh, they had uh, understand the calf lost. They, somebody told me like thirty some helicopters going in there, and uh, I'm sure a lot of them auto rotated. No, 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 nobody was killed on them, mm -hmm. but they had like 37 millimeter anti-aircraft guns all around. It was like the NVA's uh, rear area supply yeah. place for Huey, Da Nang. Yeah, they, they had a lot of fortified that, caves and things like that in that, that area. That whole, that whole kind of thing. But, but it was fortunate because, you know, the the people we encountered were their rear area guys. Mm -hmm. They weren't combat. It didn't seem to be combat troops, you know. Uh, uh, but we went in. Uh, we went in a little late, and uh, uh, because the weather weather was terrible, and I had to fly high. I mean, you know, I, I thought my head was going to explode. I must have had a sinus infection or something. But it felt like going up there. They were up so high that it felt like somebody put balloons in my sinus cavities and just pumped them to where it's going to, you know, pop. But we, we were going into what we called LZ Pepper. We we're going to start that up. And they had a, a one, I think a one bird landing pad. Mm -hmm. You can only get one bird in there, thick stuff all over. Uh, and we're coming in. And just before we're going to get out, they get fired at, and I'm not sure what happened. Um, I don't know if the guy, because his angle of attack was going to be coming in and then hover, and then I think he's going to have to back out a little bit and go mm -hmm. out because there are trees over here and, and a hill, the slope of the hill. And I, I don't know if he he, he pushed when he should have shut the what what happened, but. It took a little fire. He went a little f more forward. His rotor hit a tree, and you know it kind of, kind of went this way. We all spilled. I mean, we, we were He went more than five, six feet off the deck. We all, you know, the door gunners, and mm -hmm. there were f like three, four of us, four of us in there. Oops. Oops. Turn off your cell phones. So we spilled out of that, and then the, the, the crew got out. Uh, that the pilot and the, mm -hmm. the co-pilot got out, and uh, we kind of went up, but it closed the LZ. So now we're stuck there, and we had to had to make the pad a little bigger. And finally, they extracted the helicopter and that. But it was it was hairy. It was it was thick stuff, and uh, I'm not sure if uh, they really knew what the heck they were getting into. Well, so what they wanted to do was. Secure the hills on both mm -hmm. sides, and then they were gonna, and then we could support and sweep the thing, and, right. uh, that kind of thing. But it was it, it it was it was grossly, grossly thick, and we had uh, trees that looked like telephone pole, mm -hmm. you know, about and I don't know, a couple hundred feet high, right. and it, you hit one with a machete, and the machete just bounced back at you, you know, just harder, you know, all heartwood or something, just yeah. harder than heck, and. Uh, so it's just C4 and debt cord and, mm -hmm. and that, and we just kept doing that and doing that. And I had a, and then we kept getting people coming in. Uh, uh, we got a lot of, uh, a lot of NBA guys would come. They wouldn't even know we're there. Mm -hmm. just, and that's what I say. I think, I, I think the rear area we we surprised them, and they were trying to get back to wherever go back to Laos or something. So what yeah. happens when they show up? Well, you shoot them right. or, or whatever. And, uh, uh, you know, but uh, it was just ones and twos and that. And in fact, I was, I was taking a dump and some real high grass. It was kind of a, yeah, probably, I don't know, maybe an area 
50, 60 square feet. Mm -hmm. It wasn't much, but the, the trees all around and, and that. And so I was I was taking a dump in this grass. The grass was about, well, about as high as me, about mm -hmm. six foot high. And uh, wind was blowing and the grass was brown. And I'm looking and the grass is moving a different way from the from the thing. And here, here, two NVA guys in their khaki uniforms, like, seven or eight feet from me. They look at me, I look at them, oh shit, I'm dead. You know, I'm dead. You know, that guy's swinging his, swinging his rifle over. And then all of a sudden, poof, they're gone. The black cat knew, knew where I was. Mm -hmm. And uh, he just, he, he took him out, but he hoped that, uh, he said, geez, I sure hope you were still squatting because I didn't want to hit me. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> So, so that was that, that was the closest I came to, I think, really losing it. But uh, I mean, and, and they had no idea I was there. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, I didn't have any idea they were there. And that we we that was kind of indicative of the uh, of the uh, the thing the, the people. You know, mm -hmm. they'd just be walking around and uh, trying to get to Laos. You know, because Laos was just uh, over there, and we were firing like hell into Laos mm -hmm. too. So you know, I figured if uh, if if the guy is uh, you know, there's a line on the on the map that said. Well, that's shouldn't they have I figured am. out at some point that, that you guys were there? I mean, if you bring in helicopters and things like that, and they've got positions around there. Well, I, how long did this keep going on? I mean, was it just for a day oh, or so where this no, was happening? No, it was, it was probably a week. Mm -hmm. A week, ten days, we're getting these stragglers coming through or, or by there, or you know, and, and, and they, they probably figured that, uh, uh, they probably figured there's more in the, uh, uh, on the valley floor. That's mm -hmm. where most of the stuff was happening. Right. And uh, so, hey, we're going to go up in the hills and, and then walk the hills to, you know, where we're going. Because, you know, like a, we, we couldn't even have a cohesive pr perimeter. We just mm -hmm. threw uh, branches and brush and all the stuff that we cleared out, just make a, a brush pile so nobody could come through it, you know. Well, about how many guys were you actually with at this point? Was it a company or less uh, than that? No, or? there'd be a... a uh, we only had, we had three howitzers there, yeah, because they lost one coming, and two were up on Signal Mountain. So we had we had three howitzers there that they have, that might be 24 guys, mm -hmm. had maybe uh, two or three squads of infantry mm -hmm. with us, uh, maybe a squad of engineers, and okay. that was it. So not not a really big post by any means. No, oh no, 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 most of the... M m when I when I talk about LZs I I and that kind of thing, other than Stud and uh, my Camp Evans, uh, nothing was over a company size. You know, mm -hmm. it, it was always a smaller unit. You know, because you're spread out all over. Heck, you know, mm -hmm. you, you it you know it wasn't unusual that a battalion could have uh, their area of operation could pro possibly be uh, you know 90, 100 square miles. You know, it was. Uh, a lot of a lot of ground, right. but in the meantime, it, the enemy does not seem to have had a very clear idea of where all of you were, or what you were doing. Huh. I mean, there are other operations where they they seem to have a much better idea and they know what they're doing. But in this case, at least when your division came in, it may have hit them when they weren't really expecting it. Exactly, they, they have taken yeah. a certain amount of time to figure out what was going on. But well, how long did you stay in that area then? A couple weeks, couple okay. three weeks, yeah. and then we went to. Uh, an area east of Camp Evans on the between Highway 1 and the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, I call it the beach. It was, you know, pr pretty much like ground like around Lake Michigan, you know, real sandy, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of little creeks that break off into the, you know, eventually into the some inlets into the then into the South China Sea and that kind of stuff. A lot of graveyards. The street without joy that mm -hmm. Bernard Fall called it. Right. Uh, so we were then. I spent the rest of my time there. And so, what were you doing there? Just screening the area, you know, securing the area, screening it, operating. Uh, you know, just search. You know, company size operations going around. Uh, a lot of a lot of NVA activity, and there were uh, probably five kilometers south of this LZ was a a huge, huge Vietnamese cemetery graveyard. Mm -hmm. Probably covered 
five or six square kilometers, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, there was at least one NVA regiment in there. They were fooling around. Well, if they were there, I mean, how was it that they were allowed to stay? Well, that, that was, uh, that's the question we always ask. They were, you know, maybe, maybe 10 clicks away from a Marine regimental base, and then mm -hmm. we find these guys there, you know, and, uh, but they you know, blend in, they, you know, they, they do their thing, and. Well, did they have sort of tunnels or things in that sector? Oh, yeah, or? yeah, they, uh, each, each one, of, their, their, gra their graves were like mounds, mm -hmm. you know, big mounds, and, uh, you know, a lot of them were bunkers, and there were tunnels, and we found a, they found a hospital, underground hospital mm -hmm. there, and uh, all kinds of stuff. Now, were you regularly patrolling, trying to find them or yeah. flush them out? Is that was part of what you were doing? Mm -hmm. right. um, and get to an area, and uh, it was kind of crazy because uh, it would have been uh, the fifth mechanized infantry division, or part of the fifth, came into that area. I, I don't know if they deployed from the states or what, but uh, they they came. I know they had a beach, they had a place further north, uh, and I mean, it was a perfect area for mechanized uh, stuff. I, I had mm -hmm. no idea why they had the air mobile people there, you know, it yeah. was it was you know, great to run around with a, you know, track or a tank or, or something, but, and they came, they came down a couple times by us and then they went back, but uh, it was uh, just holding secure. And, and about how long did you stay there? Until I came home. Okay, which would have been uh, September. Okay, uh, so sort of several months then. In the same. Place. Yeah, we go after after the Ashaw Valley. We went basically to the beach, and mm -hmm. I got called the beach, and we stayed there. Uh, okay. stayed there the whole time. Now, over the course of that time, now, did you uh, ever actually get hurt yourself or wounded in any way? Yeah, I got uh, uh, <coughs> when uh, the LZ Noah again going to the bathroom. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I was up and a recoilless rifle or a round or an RPG or something hit not too far away and a concussion threw me into barbed wire, cut up my hands mm -hmm. pretty bad. Uh, nothing, you know, get a shot of, you know, get about 10 million units of bicillin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, hopefully you don't get an infection and, and that was there, but uh, you had that and uh, uh, one other time, I got a little piece of shrapnel on my finger, but other okay. than that, it was nothing, nothing too serious. No, no, no serious wound. Nothing that required hospitalization or mm -hmm. anything else. So. Okay. Now, over the course of the time that you spent in Vietnam, how much contact did you have with home? Well, my wife would try to write me every day, and my mom. I lived with my mom. Uh, my mom lived with a widowed sister, so. And I grew up with them, so mm -hmm. I always told people. I mean, today it, it, it has a different context. Yeah, I yeah. said, I didn't have a mom and dad. I just had two moms, mm -hmm. you know. And, oh, or people today, oh, oh, really? It's one of those things. But right. No, it wasn't. <laughs> but they would write, they'd write periodically. And mm -hmm. uh, I'd get, uh, mail was usually pretty good. But, you know, sometimes, especially if you moved or redeploying someplace, it took, took maybe a week or two to catch up with you. But, you know, and I, I'd try to write home. You know, as often as I could. Uh, you know, sometimes it was I could write every day. Sometimes maybe once every ten days. You know, just. Would they try to follow you and keep track of where you were? No, I don't think so. I'm not sure. I may my brother may have, mm -hmm. but uh, he was an old. He, he was a former Marine. He he didn't serve in Vietnam, but he he got out before, before Vietnam started up. But uh, I don't. I, I'm not sure. I really don't know. I never yeah. talked to him about mm -hmm. it. Did you have any sense that they were they were worried about you, or they'd follow the news and be afraid of what might be happening to you, or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. I I, I think you know, the, 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 I I think in a lot of ways it was a lot worse on my wife and the people back here because they really didn't know what was happening, you know, and they would, you know, you saw it on TV all the time and on the news, mm -hmm. and they'd have the score box, you know, the the, the score count and all that, so it was, I, I think it was a lot tougher on them, and uh, I did see my, when I was there, I did see my wife once, she, uh, I took my, uh, I was in country about nine months, and I got my R&R, &R and I went to Hawaii, mm -hmm. and then she came over and, and met me, met me there, so, saw her for about a week. 
What was it like to be in Hawaii at that point and see her after nine months in Vietnam? <sighs> It, it was great. It, it, it was good. Uh, it was, uh, it was, you know, the, you know, the old stereotype of, uh, geez, I was more comfortable sleeping on the floor than in the bed, mm -hmm. and, you know, and I, I like the bed, you know. <laughs> but it, 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 it was like it took somebody out of a, a primitive condition, and you know, we basically lived in field mm -hmm. uh, the whole time. Didn't even have our own clothes, you know. Every once a week, they'd bring a mail bag out and they'd pull a a top and bottom, mm -hmm. put them on and throw the old ones out. Somebody would, maybe that guy I was in uh, basic with, that Puerto Rican guy, maybe he was doing the laundry, mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, uh, they, they would get that done and uh, we would do it. So it was, you know, getting caught up on, I was a little paranoid about traffic and people and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that kind of thing. But we had a great time and the people in Hawaii were just tremendously gracious. Tremendous, I mean, you know, as if I didn't wear a uniform, but you mm -hmm. know, yeah, it, they knew where I was yeah. from, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, hotels gave us discounts, restaurants gave us discounts, free drinks, uh, mm -hmm. just, you know, it just, it, it was a wonderful experience. And How hard was it to go back? Terribly hard, terribly hard, because, you know, it, it's kind of funny, because uh, I don't know if other people had this same thing, but, you know, that, you, you know you have a life, you know there's something else there. But the f longer you're away from it, the more abstract it becomes, mm -hmm. and your present reality is, it was, is, and always will be, you know, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And then, uh, so, you know, y y y you kind of just compartmentalize your homesickness and your, your stuff. You know you have it, and you read a letter, and and that kind of stuff, but it's it's like that that emotional connection mm -hmm. isn't it, it becomes weaker and weaker as time goes by and then now boy now you have it again and oh geez you don't want to leave and that's why you know I have tremendous admiration for these guys today they're in Afghanistan or Iraq because I don't see how they do it they go out on patrol we're in a firefight and then at night they're talking real time with their wife and mm -hmm. the kids telling them about their little league ball game mm -hmm. I, I would just lose it I would be you know I I just can't imagine that you know because it's it took you know it it, it took you a little time to become a good field soldier mm -hmm. to begin with and you get in a routine and yeah you, you know you have it and sometimes when I was there, they they, just, they start sending tape recordings, mm -hmm. and I know one of the guys had bought a little battery tape recorder, and uh, I know that first time I heard my wife sent me a tape, I must have written to her and said, hey, they got tapes, mm -hmm. and, or they found out or something. I don't, I can't remember how how that happened, but you know, boy, that really bummed me out hearing the voice and hearing mm -hmm. hearing the goo goo gaga yeah. of my little son and and. And that's holy smokes! There is there is something in life without you know leeches and bugs and and snakes and bad guys and primitive living and you know all that kind of stuff. It's you know so it's uh, it, it 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 was very very hard coming back. And I uh, I I I know I came back and I talked to first sergeant. We got a new first sergeant just before I left. Well, when we were up at case something, mm -hmm. we got a new first sergeant. And I, I come back, told him, I ain't, I'm not going to do anything dumb anymore. I'm just going to play it safe. And da, 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 da. He said, I understand, Mac, I understand exactly where you're coming from. I won't give you a hard time. So, mm -hmm. okay, thanks. You know, so. And, so but it, it took me a while to get out of that. Then it, it, it was kind of interesting how quick that uh, other identity, that other reality then absorbs you again, mm -hmm. too, you know. And you had about three months left then? Yeah. You had this yeah. Day? All right. yeah, I came back from Hawaii probably mid-June, mm -hmm. and then I got out in uh, September. Okay. Uh, now, did you spend the full time that you had been drafted to serve, or did you get out a little early? No, I got, uh, when, when I went to Vietnam, they had what they call the 90-day drop. If you had less than 90 days to do in the service, mm -hmm. you would get out uh, when you came home. I. Uh, and I, I would have had, I had a total of 22 months when, when I got out. Why mm -hmm. I was there, they changed it to, I think, six months, five or six months, because they were getting, you know, so you're a drafted guy, 
you got, you know, after your basic AIT, your home leave, your Vietnam training, you probably got s maybe six months, seven months at the most in, mm -hmm. and then you go to the country and then you come back. Mm -hmm. What kind of soldier are you going to be? What, what right. are you going to send me to Vietnam? Forget it. I'm not going to mm -hmm. sign my shoes. You know, I'm not going to do this stuff. It's uh, So I, I, I think they probably did that on a kind of a, a self-defensive method to get out. But no, I, I got out right away. I, I, I was landed in the United States at Fort Lewis, Washington at about 10 o'clock, 9, 10 o'clock in the morning, and I signed out of the Army at 10.30 that night. Had anybody made any effort to suggest that you re-up or anything like that? Oh, or? yeah, yeah. Well, when I got, uh, when I first got to the unit, uh, I know that uh, I said we, they tested us, mm -hmm. okay? I mean, just gave us a situation. Right. What would you do? How would right. you do this right. stuff? So. And I, I'm not sure what all they had in terms of records on me, but I know the company commander, or battery commander, when I got there, when, uh, after the test, he, he took me to the side and said, well, you know, boy, you can go to OCS. That's still open for you. If you want, you'd be back in Oklahoma in a week. I, well, thank you, sir, but no, i just not, not interested. Mm -hmm. And then the, uh, the executive officer uh, w w worked, he it would normally not pull radio watch, but he uh, he pulled for about a week and a half. He pulled radio watch with me, and he was trying to talk me into. You know, I said, you know, I said, you know, no disrespect, but the only way I'd take a commission is with the proviso that I could resign it the next day and leave the army. <laughs> you know, so it's, uh, because you know my dad was uh, he, he he had a regular army commission right. and he was killed, mm -hmm. and if my brother and I, if we met the the academic criteria, we could have gotten an appointment to any of the service academies mm -hmm. we wanted to go to. But uh, it, that was off my radar. I right. wasn't interested in it. And then when we, <laughs> that's one of the things when we were out processing in Fort Lewis, we had two real sharp looking Army recruiters come in and they had to talk to you, give you the mm -hmm. re-up re mm -hmm. stuff. And, and, and they, they, they phrased it well. It was, uh, hey, we know, you know, hey, we're the reenlistment guys and all the boos and cat calls and all mm -hmm. that. I say, oh, yeah, well, yeah, I don't know how you feel, but once you get out in that real world and, you know, it's, uh, if, if it's not what you think it is, think about the Army. You know, mm -hmm. we have, you know, you guys, you, you, you did your time there. Uh, you can pick schools. You can, you know, da-da-da-da-da-da. And, you know, you don't have to you don't have to be a grunt. You don't have to run a tank. You don't have to cock a cannon. You know, there's a lot of other things you mm -hmm. can do, and well, we love to have you in the army. So, you know, if it looks, if you know, we all, I, I for those of us coming back in '68, we had this little ditty. We'd say the the Golden Gate in six, '68, the bread line in '69. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, yeah. Uh, Oh, we always, always do that. So I, I'm sure I'm sure there was a few guys there, and, and we had guys that re-upped while they were in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, they either re-upped or extended for another tour because they were so desperate to get a leave home or something, you know. And they uh, they did that, but it was uh, I don't know of anybody that uh, that re-enlisted. Uh, mm -hmm. Not there, very now, in, in the Vietnam era, one of the things the military tried to do to maintain, I guess, combat effectiveness was they would rotate men in and out of units individually. So you join your unit as a replacement, and it's still out there doing what it's doing when you leave it. Mm -hmm. uh, now, did that work fairly well for you in the sense that you were joining people who knew what they were doing oh, and they could show you? And yeah, it, it, it worked, but I, I, as I said, it was... It, it was basically a unit of strangers, mm -hmm. you know, because the... The, the the unit would deploy over there. You know, they, they let's say they they I, I think the CAV first went over there probably September August to September of whenever sixty five yeah. or or whatever. So that year anniversary every August or September they're churning people. Okay, mm -hmm. you, you get a new cast of characters, but then you get you're replacing your casualties. A lot of the uh, CAV guys when they originally came over they didn't have a full year. Some may have had six months to go, some may have had three months, mm -hmm. some may have had nine months, so they were they were churning. Um, uh, we would, you, you join the unit, and, and we even had guys that we would get guys, uh, 
oh, we were on the beach and we got three or four guys from the 4th Infantry Division that they had like six months left in the, uh, six or eight months left. So they switched, you know, they, they, they came they came to us and we gave them somebody that had maybe a year. I, mm -hmm. I don't know how, but it was, it was a constant, it was a constant kind of uh, uh, rotation. Mm -hmm. it, it was the, most of the new guys would just learn by watching mm -hmm. and uh, some had, like I was fortunate to have, uh, I had a couple tremendous mentors. I had Ray, this, this one guy I was with on Catfish, he, he taught me a lot and mm -hmm. then I had a a uh, senior NCO, Sergeant Shankle, who did, uh, 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 it, it was a good soldier, and he, they took me under their wings mm -hmm. and, and, and did that. Most of the guys, you you know, you only associate it with the, the guys that you, you, you were directly involved right, with. Right, so in your and, immediate unit or... And, ones you were assigned to, yeah. And I th quite frankly, I think that that rotation policy, at well, the higher levels, it got ridiculous. I mean, I, like battalion command structures, they would totally change every mm -hmm. six months because people wanted to, their uh, ticket punched right. and uh, they wanted a combat command. And, and I know when I was there, when I was on the beach, or maybe just before the beach, we got a totally new command structure. Uh, they, they, Comes uh, CO, XO, all the S1, 2, 3, all these guys in tech from a unit in Germany. Mm -hmm. It's right there. And then, then they're doing crazy stuff like now they have promotion boards. Mm -hmm. Give me a break. You know, you you go there and, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the guy's known his job out in the field, but he has to go to a board and answer some stupid question mm -hmm. about, you know, how many cans of shoe polish he has to use to spit shine his shoes or, mm -hmm. you know, just, just, just stupid stuff. And I think. You know, uh, hindsight's always twenty twenty, but uh, I, th I I think that policy cost a lot of guys their lives because I mean uh, no nobody nobody learned by their mistakes. They're making the same mistakes over again and and expecting people to do stuff that uh, they might not be able to do. Mm -hmm. But and and like com well. Command and control. I've ne I never, other than oh, on a couple LZs, we had some a couple visitors. Once we had the, we had Abrams come by, when we were out on the beach. Mm -hmm. Abrams and Tolson, who was the a cap commander, he'd come out, see the boys for half an hour, and they 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 leave. But you know, on active command kind of thing, I never saw anybody over above the rank of captain. Mm -hmm. And most most of these guys were, uh, you know. They're probably my age, ROTC kids, mm -hmm. you know, graduated from college, 21, 22. Right. Uh, second lieutenant for maybe eight months, first lieutenant. And they, want a, they want another bar. Okay, I'll take a, you know, they finish their, mm -hmm. their basic course and off they, or, you know, whatever. So right. it was, and I can understand part of it because we all hate it. Charlie, Charlie, you know what I'm talking about when I say Charlie, Charlie, command and control helicopter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, they're, they're always over you. You know, you have this big area of operation, so the battalion command structure's up there going around, they're flying around, they're just getting, air. I don't know, I even think they wanted to see how many oak leaf clusters they could get under air metal or something. And, uh, you know, but then at night, you know, hot showers, nice bed, grilled steaks, some some good scotch, maybe mm -hmm. a nice bottle of wine with their meal, and uh, oh, geez, I'm roughing it. I'm in combat. Then the next day, they're back out again, and here the poor guy they had no idea what what it's like out there, you know. Yeah. And, in uh, a lot of uh, units or areas, the the divide seems to have been between kind of captain and major. If you're the captain and you're out there in the field with the line units, then you know what it's like to be there. But if you're the guy in the helicopter yeah. or back at headquarters, you don't. Well, and part of it, I think, is because of nature, they were so spread out. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, it's. Uh, but you know, it, it, I, I often think that it, it it created a lot of misunderstanding, and uh, you know, quite frankly, some some things that it was. Uh, they, they had no idea what, mm -hmm. what was happening. So mm -hmm. then they have to look for stupid stuff to measure effectiveness, right. and. Uh, you know, like like this body count business. It mm -hmm. was, you know, we got. I never forget one time was shooting in a naval destroyer, and these guys. Well, and I can understand that they, you know, they're they're off. 
they sleep. They got nice sheets mm -hmm. and all this, and they're shooting. And they they want to they want to make sure that they're uh, doing some good, right. you know. So you know they would you know we you know you, you give them an end of mission, and you know you were supposed to communicate the effectiveness of it, you know. Say, oh, okay, yeah, we got two right arms and a left foot here for you, you know. So paint that on the barrel of your gun, or. <laughs> Got five chickens and a water buffalo, or you know, it's you know, it it, it was. I th I think back about war, and, and I, I guess maybe it's just the, uh, the was the nature of the war, but you know, it was, it, you know, it, it, like well, it really upset a lot of us as you know we were on the beach and find out they they, they abandoned Quezon. Well, mm -hmm. why go there in the first place, you know? about uh, some of just the relationship between people who were up in the front lines and the ones who served in, in the rear echelons and so forth. Uh, I don't know, how much contact did you have with those guys or in what capacity? It, it, you really didn't have much contact other than when you went back to a rear area for, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for, for some reason, you know, if you had a dental problem or on R, in and out on R&R &R mm -hmm. or, or stuff like that. But, you know, it, there, there was a lot of... Uh, a lot of resentment. I mean, everybody over there got the same, what, sixty-five dollar a month combat pay. Mm -hmm. You know, that, you know, and, and somebody is, you know, it's, I, I get, I, I'll give you a little story about it. My first year back, my my wife's mother was one of thirteen children, and they have a huge Christmas party. And, and in fact, they used to have to rent a hall. So, one of one of my wife's cousins. Married this guy he was graduated from Notre Dame. Was an engineer, some kind of engineer, and he was in ROTC mm -hmm. and he was in Vietnam. And at this Christmas party, she was bemoaning the fact that uh, he hadn't called home in a week. You know, they had these Mars mm -hmm. calls. And uh, so I said, "Gee, well, what's he doing?" And oh, yeah, you know, he's he's keeping busy. He's keeping busy. He's like on two softball teams, and he's he's in a tennis league, and uh, you know this kind of stuff. And my wife just about lost it. And, what, uh, you know, what are you worried about? You know, that, that, that kind of thing. So, th there was just the the in a, uh, there, I, I I guess maybe I I felt it more than most guys. I'm not sure, but I, I thought there was a tremendous inequity. A tremendous inequity, like like with, you know, here in in Air Cav, we were in the air more than paratroopers were, but mm -hmm. paratroopers still got junk junk right. pay. Right. Uh, uh, you know, uh, to me, they should have taken the the combat pay, you know, the sixty five dollars, and and if you were an infantryman, you should have got probably five hundred dollars a month, you know, and uh, if you were counting bullets someplace, you you know maybe you should got fifteen dollars or. Or, or something that way, because, and it was it was just two different worlds. It was, you know, one world was the army, you know, this the typical stateside kind of thing, and your badges of rank, and mm -hmm. and this kind of thing. I, I'll tell you an interesting, a, a little uh, story about that. I I think it was when I was coming back from an R and R. I'm not sure if it was in country or whatever, but anyway, I teamed up with this. Uh, in on K, this uh, black kid is medic, when an eighth cav, and we transportation was all screwed up, and we couldn't get from on K up north, so they routed us through Cameron Bay. So you probably have better better deal to get in a flight there. Mm -hmm. Now, you know you're in a field unit. You don't have your own clothes. You just get pick out a pair of pants from the mailbag and mm -hmm. a shirt, and no name, no badges of rank, anything. Only thing we had is a wore soft hat and had to big yellow calf patch stitched mm -hmm. right on the top of it. So we're in Cameron Bay, and obviously we, we, we stick out like a sore thumb because we're, uh, we have no, the jungle boots black and the green, but well, our boots were white because all the, the color was bleached off. Uh, we had low priority to fly, so we're just, we, there's no seats, so we sit, sit with our back to the wall and just take a nap. We're by the gate, say, mm -hmm. told the, NCO gate agent to hey give us a call when something opens up you know so I'm napping and here's somebody's kicking my foot and I open my eyes and this guy starts yelling and screaming at us we got come it was a sergeant major had a steel pot on 
had a flak jacket on, broke starch, spit shine boots, mm -hmm. all this stuff, and just yelling at us that we're a disgrace to the Cav and the uniform and what's our name and serial numbers, he's going to burn us so bad that, you know, Lucifer's, we're going to think hell is air conditioned because he's going to bring so much heat on us and just yelling and yelling and yelling. And it was just, a, just <laughs> so these two guys walking by, pilots, they got their flight suits on mm -hmm. and this kind of stuff. And they stopped and they were watching us for a while. So one guy, one guy was the first lieutenant. He goes over to the sergeant major, says, Sergeant major, I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes. So he gets them off and off tight. And, and they have kind of an animated, hush conversation. I can't hear what's being said. And the sergeant major goes storming off. He goes walking nine. And the guys come by and he says, hey, soldiers, don't, don't worry. The guy won't give you any more problems. I said, well, thank you, sir. I really appreciate it, you know. Uh, I said, besides, I'm, I, if he was going to throw me in jail, I think that'd be better than where I'm going. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> and we kind of laughed. And I said, well, what, what did you do to get this guy off of us? He said, well, to make a long story short, I told him that where you guys come from, you kill pricks like him. <laughs> okay. He said, you guys, where are you going? I told him and said, uh, you guys want a beer? Yeah. And he took us out, bought us a couple beers, and told, told the gate agent to, you know, put us on the next manifest or whatever mm -hmm. and they were nice guys you know they flew in it turned out they flew they were, flew fighter bombers i don't know what kind but uh, mm -hmm. and they were interested in and they found out what i did and they i i'd called in a few airstrikes mm -hmm. and they they wanted to know how we viewed you know how, how it was viewed on the ground and i said all i can say is this is like today you saved our ass again mm -hmm. you know it's uh it's there so so they're just two, two different realities you know and uh and, and, and a lot of resentment about the, uh, the you know, the, the, the guys that, you know, in, in the rear, I mean, the people are making money hand over fist on doing different kinds of things. And, uh, uh, you know, just like the perfectly legal 18% deal I had going mm -hmm. in Van Viet, you know. And, uh, uh, but it was, you know, it, it was, it, it was like, People just couldn't understand it, you know, and the, 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 the gl glaring inequity was, that uh, uh, it, it bothered me. I'm not, I'm not sure if it bothered as, as deeply a lot of other people, but it, it really did bother me. I, I just felt it was uh, that a certain part of us were being taken advantage of. Okay. Now, uh, what was it like to actually go home then? You finally, you, you get yourself discharged, you go on back home. What happens next? What, when I got home? Yeah. Or, well, I got home. I walked off that plane. As I said, I, uh, this back before they had these, you know, the plane just pulled up the mm -hmm. fence, and you get off, you put a little stairway down, right. and you get off, and there's my wife holding holding my baby boy, who was a lot bigger than I thought he was going to be, because mm -hmm. now he's a year old, and uh, a little over a year old. There's my brother, my mother, my aunt, and I said, I said, the first step I took on that platform was the first step of the rest of my life, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it was it was great. I got home, uh, took off my uniform, shaved my. I, I started after R and R. I started growing a short timer mustache, so I shaved the mustache. I don't like facial hair, so I I did that, and uh, I always. Just visited for a couple, three days, and my wife and I and baby, we just took off and took a little vacation. Just drove around and saw. I had a, a friend, actually, he, he was my best man when I got married, but he my best man by default because we had to push our wedding up, mm -hmm. as I told you. And my brother was out of the Marines going to school, and he was in summer school, and he couldn't get out of an exam. So. And I'm Catholic, so back then your best man and maid of honor had to be uh, uh, had to be Catholic. Mm -hmm. So everybody else in my wedding party wasn't, but a friend of my brother's was coming in for the wedding, who was. So I made him. He was my best man, mm -hmm. and he'd sent me. Uh, he would send out to the field the care packages Mama wouldn't send. You know, but he had a buddy that was on the vice squad. He lived in Rochester, New York, so he would bust. Uh, when they busted a porno shop or something, he'd take some of the magazines <laughs> and we'd put them in a box and some like a lot of airline little bottles of whiskey and mm -hmm. stuff and send it to us every, you know, about once a month we'd get something from them. You know, everybody always looked forward to my 
Guardian Ed's mm -hmm. care packages. But well, I just took a took a trip, just poked around, went up to Canada for a little while, and did that, and start looking for a job. And, and then what kind of work did you go into? Well, I, I got into uh, what's called, what today would be considered called human resources. Mm -hmm. I uh, uh, it was kind of funny. I, I I had veterans return rights to Bendix, the aerospace company, but I, I didn't really like what I was doing there. Mm -hmm. So I uh, was just looking around, and uh, there was this big plant that was uh, this company was really expanding, and uh, uh, they they had six unions under one roof, and they. Uh, the industrial relations manager wanted somebody to handle discipline. So he looked at me and said, oh, you're about 6'4", just back from the war. I think you're perfect. Mm -hmm. So he hired me. So I, I, I stayed in that kind of work for the rest of my life, or west rest of my working life. Yeah. All right. But and at what uh, point did you wind up in Michigan? Well, I, uh, I'd worked for this guy. Well, the fellow that hired me, he got promoted out, and uh, they brought in a guy to replace him. And then I left. I wanted to run my own show, so to speak. And I left, and uh, then the fellow, and, but I became very friendly with the guy who, the, my original mm -hmm. boss's replacement, we became very, very friendly, very close. And he moved up here. He took a job as a senior VP at Wolverine Worldwide, and he had an opening. And uh, he called me up. Said, "Oh no, he didn't call me up because we met. Uh, mm -hmm. We met for dinner because uh, we were back. We were living in Iowa, and we we were back and having dinner with him and his wife. And uh, I said, well, how, how would you guys like to come back to Michigan?' And my wife said, "When?" <laughs> That's how we ended up here. So he hired me, came up there. So. But uh, I did. I, I did get. I think I got one thing accomplished uh, for veterans because I, I came back, and I was uh, a little upset because I couldn't take advantage of the GI Bill because I had four years of uh, veterans-funded education. So my father-in-law was kind of a minor politician mm -hmm. in Indiana, and. Uh, they would have these smokers, these political smokers, and as everybody goes down and kick in a few bucks for the guy's campaign fund, and you drink and eat and have a good time. So at that time, our congressman, he was the Democratic whip in Congress, and he was running, uh, well, he was, he was working the crowd. In fact, he had graduated the high school I went to. And I saw my father-in-law and said, hey, Jim, uh, uh, How's it going? This or that. My my father-in-law had a couple too many, and he says, "You know, it ain't fair." I said, "Well, well what's not fair?" He said, hey, "This young man here, you know, my son-in-law, as I introduced me, he said, you know, he just come back from the war in Vietnam, and he can't get the GI Bill." Well, why? Well, he his dad was killed in the war, so in the Second World War, so he went to school under War Orphans Education, and the VA says you can only have 48 months. He said, "But you know." They did it. What his dad would do, his dad would have paid his way through school if he he wasn't killed. So mm -hmm. I, you know, he should get some for his service. And Brad was said, you know, I, I agree with you. I, mm -hmm. I think right. And about a year and a half later, they passed a writer that I could get people like me could get 12 more months. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I like to say that uh, you know obviously you the legislation wasn't named for me, but I'd like to say that maybe I influenced that. Right. But. Uh, if you look back on the whole thing now, how do you think your, your time in the service wound up affecting you? Well, you know, it's just like one of those diseases you can never get rid of. They, you had some, it had some, I, I, I'd be a fool to say it, but there were some wonderful times and there were some terrible times. Uh, met a lot of good people that were, and, and I think that's probably my biggest regret. Uh, you know, we talked about the replacement, mm -hmm. you know, people coming in and out. and. You know, I, I know people by their radio call signs, maybe they're, you know, like, like I can tell you my company commander's name, I don't know what his name was, he's always 2-6. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, a nickname, and this and that, and I wish I would have gotten, in a way, I wish I would have gotten more contact information because uh, 
uh, when I came home, I didn't want anything to do with any any of that. I'm just going to get on with my life and, and build my life. But but later, as you reflect and uh, just hey, I'd like to you know. It'd be fun just sit around, drink a few beers, and you know, spit, scratch, and tell lies, and you know, that kind of thing. And but then on the other hand, with some of these guys, you know, you don't know if their name's on the wall in Washington or not. So it, it could be kind of bittersweet. I did have contact with one other person, and he was uh, he was an officer. He was an F.O. And he. I often wondered what happened to him because we were about the physically we were about the same, like tall and back then tall and skinny, you know. Now I'm just tall. Uh, and he he was an airborne ranger, you know, really gung ho guy, but just ROTC. And his dad and his uncle were they were with some big prestigious law firm in L.A. And he was gonna always go to law school. Right? I'm gonna come home. He had a little more time to do in the Army, but uh, I mean, like six months or so, and I'm going to do my six months or eight months or whatever it was, and then go to law school and, you know, got, got something nailed there, and that'd be good. So, I, you know, I, I, I knew his last name, and, uh, well, we have a, alumni, so the first CAV has a pretty active division association. I call it my al alumni association. So I get this call. Oh, geez must be three, four years ago, around Thanksgiving. Uh, it's the Monday of Thanksgiving week. And it's this guy. He said, hey, I'm going to be in Lansing. Why don't you come on up? We say hi. Sure, I'll be up. Well, I go up there. Well, he tells me where to go. But make a long story short, he was, uh, he never did become, a, never did go to law school. Figured out why he was in the Army, uh, why he was stateside. He said, you know, I always wanted to learn how to fly. So he used a GI Bill to go to flight school, and he became an airline pilot. He had to retire at 60. So then he became a corporate pilot. And he was, uh, uh, he, he, he was, uh, he, he, he was uh, Senator Kerry's wife's pilot for, uh, she's the heir to the Heinz fortune, was her pilot for a while, three or four years, but now he's, he's Magic Johnson's pilot. <laughs> uh, and uh, he was coming to bring magic over to Lansing to celebrate, you know, Thanksgiving with his, his family. So I, I didn't know this, you know, and it, it, he, he tells me this. So I, I go over there and uh, waiting in the terminal, and magic comes out, and it, his family's there waiting for me. He, he sees me there, and he comes up. Oh, you're waiting for my, my pilot, aren't you? Yeah, well, war buddies. Right, yeah, I introduced. We had beautiful conversation with the guy. Then Clark came down. Now, originally, he was going to come over to the house and, and stay, but Magic said, well, you know, him the co-pilot, just take the plane back to L.A. and come back and pick me up, you know, so, which, which was nice because it, uh, you know, that cost him a lot, it cost a lot of money to do that, so, but, so, I met him. So, every, I, I couldn't, uh, he was in Benton Harbor a couple of weeks ago. He gave me a call, but I, I couldn't make it to Benton Harbor that day, but, uh, so that's the one guy I had contact with, and it was so strange. But there's a lot of these, a lot, a lot of these fellows. I would, you know, they. I guess you didn't realize how much of a part of you they are, you know. And then, and you know, they just, yeah, you know, you know, like Helmworth's book. We were soldiers once and young, you know. Mm -hmm. so I guess we're always soldiers, but we we don't stay young. You know? The one, the last question that I got here, kind of, kind of gone. You know, when you got back, now you're in a time when a lot of public opinion is turning against the war more dramatically. There's more of the negative news content coverage. There's protests. There's a lot of that kind of stuff going on. Did you pay much attention to any of that, or did that register at all with you, or did you just go about your business and not worry about it? Well, I, I never had, I, I never had anybody, you know, spit on me or throw, because if they would have, I would have taken them out, you know, it's uh, uh, just, but I, I, I never was exposed to that, I, I, and I'm not really sure how intense that was. Of course, mid, the Midwest is something a little different. I did follow the war on the, on the news. Uh, I was really, uh, especially when they went into Cambodia, I know the CAV was going there, but uh, 
but you know, I, 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 I did follow that. I, I personally felt that I, I didn't know why we were fighting. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I thought I had come to the conclusion that it was a colossal waste, and that we should have just said, "Hey, you know, we're out of there," and uh, or or do something else, uh, and you know, because of the, I. You know, I, I I wonder if things would have been different if we would have just taken over the country and put in like a MacArthur to be czar, like they did in Japan after the Second World War, and give them people some. And because the Vietnamese people, they're great people, industrious, uh, uh, they're brave people, and, and yeah, these guys were just fighting for their country, you know. And uh, uh, I I always thought it was. Uh, it was a mistake. I never really questioned why we. Well, I, I grew up under the domino theory that you know, geez, if we don't stop them there, we're going to be fighting them in Cedar Springs, you know, and uh, uh, and and you know, we viewed communism as this, you know, this monolith that was going to be, you know, it's, it's one size fits everybody, and they're godless, and we're going to be the this kind of thing, and th that wasn't the case. And yeah, you know, it's just some little farmer shooting at you every now and then, and. Uh, or doing something, it takes incredible courage to do that when he knows what you're going to do back to him. And, and so I, I just felt that it was uh, that the, the, our policy was wrong. And uh, uh, although, on the other hand, I didn't like the anti-war protests because they were vilifying the soldiers when they guys were just doing what what they had to do. Yeah, you know, didn't have any choice about it. They were they were reluctant soldiers, and you know we were reluctant soldiers. So I, I didn't like that part of it, and, and I thought for a large number of them, their motives were, you know, there, there were no geopolitical concerns in their motive. They were just scared that they'd have to go in and, 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 and do something. And, you know, it was, uh, I think, the wrong war in the wrong place at the wrong time. But it, it was there, and I, I feel sorry for the, the people that didn't make it back. Because it's you know when you when you do something like that, I mean you know you can read all the books in the world and all of this and all of that, and it's uh, you know there there's no glory in fighting a war, you know. Yeah. There's you know there's 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 just a base reality that that's terrifying and you know it's just, so I don't know if I answered your question or not, but I I, I think it was. Uh, they ultimately, part of why we do this is that we want, as best we can, to record well, what was the experience like and what do the people who were there actually think of it. Uh, sometimes people find out about the project and what I'm doing. They're, the first assumption is probably kind of like a lot of the teenage war project is assumption. They don't really know anything, so they figure, oh, you're out to glorify the war or something like that. And no, you're not watching the interviews, are you? So yeah. It's not to be what comes out. Well, you know, I'll, I'll, although I'll tell you, if uh, if you want to glorify something, it's uh, uh, the there was a I, I don't know about other people that you interviewed, but we had an inordinate amount of pride in our unit mm -hmm. in the first calf, an inordinate amount of pride. I mean, you you see that that patch. On, on somebody's right shoulder, they know they were in combat, and now they're your brother forever. I mean, it, 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 regardless of what war it was. I mean, I had a, a National Guard guy save my bacon in the post-9-11 Atlanta airport. He had a cap patch on, and I had a problem with a security guy, and it's when they, the guys were there with rifles, mm -hmm. and he come by, and he took care of it. Ah, first cab, hey, so there we go. But, you know, so that way there, there's, there's a lot of... I, I took a lot of pride in my unit. I still do, to this day. I'm, 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 I, I think, I think the best compliment somebody could give me is say, "Hey, you're a sky trooper," and that's, that's what I was, and that's what I am. But, uh, but the, you know, war as such is, uh, you know, you don't want to glorify it. But I have to say, for the record, I'm, I'm not sure about anybody else's experience, but we never were chased off the field of battle by any of these guys. Maybe we should have been, but we never were. So if we lost it, we lost it. Uh, you know, I, I don't even like the term, we lost the war. We just chose not to continue with it anymore. 
because uh, you know I mean we had we 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 I mean it was incredible what what, what we could have done and yeah. did. But ultimately, there's a limit to what the military can actually do in some of these situations. Mm -hmm. And if the, the root problem was was political, it almost didn't matter. Mm -hmm. and that may have been what you were in. <laughs> and what did General Grant say? He said, I, I, I'm, I'm probably not quoting him right, but uh, he said, I can't think of any, any problem between people that would have to be resolved by violence or with violence, or something like that. And I think he's right. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, but All right. Like anyway. Okay. That makes a pretty good point to conclude on, I yeah. think. So thanks for taking the time. Oh, to you're welcome. I appreciate it. Uh, I hope it works out, and I wish you every success in your endeavor. And uh, and one, one of these days, when you get my little the thing I gave you, just uh, take a look at it. Yeah, there could be a book in the works, people. All right, All right. thank you. Yeah, I'll autograph them for you. <laughs>